Well, welcome to the uh, SAC debates. Um, this is, I believe, the first time that this has been an RC organized SAC debate. Uh, so you're here, part of history in the making. Um, now, it was our 19th Prime Minister who said that elections are not a time for serious issues. That was Kim Campbell. She later lost the election, the biggest landslide. Anyway, so it's clear that elections are the time for the serious issues. So I'm going to introduce our two moderators, our co-moderators. We have Alex McDonald, who has a long history with the SAC, and is the current Argosy Opinions and Editorial Editor. And we also have Julie Stevenson, the current SAC VP Communications, who also has a long history with the Argosy. So we've got a nice balance here of previous knowledge and current uh, exuberance, we'll say. Um, <clears throat> so um, we're going to get started right away here since uh, we're a bit below time. So I'll hand it over to the moderators and uh, we'll get started. All right, first up, we'll call up the three <coughs> candidates for president. Uh, we'll do some opening statements, and then we'll get into some debate questions uh, for, for you to go to. Uh, grab the mic up there from, from John. And for our first opening statement, we have uh, Rebecca. Um, hi everyone, uh, good evening and thanks for coming tonight. Um, my name is Rebecca Hebb, but some of you may know me just as Dex. Um, I'm thrilled to be running for one of your presidential candidates for the upcoming SAC election. And I believe I'm qualified for this position because I've always loved being engaged in the activities on campus and discussing uh, the issues that are plaguing our student body. Um, also, in the last couple of weeks, I've been actively learning about the uh, initiatives that the SAC has been pursuing in, uh, over the course of the past semester and upcoming in this semester, and how the SAC is run. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm a third year commerce student uh, pursuing a minor in environmental studies. Um, also, I was an RA in Campbell uh, last year. Um, I believe that I am an ideal presidential candidate because I am a rational and intuitive thinker, an, infect, an effective communicator, and determined to make things happen. I'm also a proud Mountie and a passionate, passionate about student issues and concerns. Um, my vision for the SAC is that as an open-minded individual, and I believe I have a unique background that will bring a fresh perspective to the SAC. However, I do not intend to micromanage the SAC, but rather act in a supporting role to the VPs and it would be my responsibility to ensure that their initiatives are followed through whilst pursuing new and existing overarching goals of the SAC. These goals include awareness and openness of the SAC, increased sense of community among the students, overall preparedness of students for their career, and an upgrade of technology on campus. Thank you. Joyce. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everybody, my name is, is Pat Joyce. Uh, I have been lucky enough uh, this year to serve as president of the Students' Union um, and I am hoping to do it again. Um, I would very much like to come work for you again. Um, I think this year has been uh, a pretty successful one and after having, having been in the position uh, for this year, I think the two um, biggest biggest areas that the SAC uh, can increase are, are uh, relatively inward looking. So uh, right now, um, I, I think the two, uh, I guess the two areas we really need to improve are uh, number one with our policy and research support. So uh, policy is essentially any political stance that the SAC has. So for example, this year uh, we created a policy that we were opposed to determining this on Dawn contracts. Um, and right now our policies are founded on exactly what students want and they're, they're really, uh, really good in principle. Um, the other component of good policy is research. Um, so we should be able to uh, have well-researched and sound policies that we bring forward to the provincial government, the federal government, to the administration, to the town, and when we're lobbying. Uh, and in, in order to do that, for any good ad advocacy organization uh, to really, really create sound policy, uh, you do need policy and research support. Um, so what I'd like to do, uh, one of the first things, is 
uh, create a position of a policy and research officer. Now, there's a few ways this could happen. Um, I think uh, I think a great way to start it would actually be to hire a student. Um, and it's something I've spoken with the political science department about uh, and, and trying to create uh, create a position where you could actually get credit uh, for doing policy and research studies uh, for the students' union. Um, the other the other challenge that faces the SAC, I think, uh, it is to do with communication. Uh, and I think it comes not from a lack of effort, but from a lack of consistency. Uh, and I think that uh, what we really lack is is a clear brand. And so when you hear when you hear issues from students of, well, I don't know what the SAC does, or I don't know what the difference is between the SAC and the university, that's not because the SAC uh, doesn't do enough work to communicate what it does. It's because there needs to be a consistent brand of exactly what we provide and who we are. So those are the two goals two goals that uh, that I would like to accomplish. And I'm um, looking forward to the questions to come. I'm Jacob Levine. I am a third year biology major and a physics minor. I have now served two years in the SAC, first year as a Capitol Hall SAC rep, and second year right now as a science senator. So what I think I can bring to the SAC as president, I believe that my creativity to innovate new projects to benefit the students of Mount Allison, and not only the, that, but the, the determination to bring them forward and to make them become a reality. So a few things that are on my platform would be, uh, I believe that we can promote some internships and some volunteer opportunities within and outside SACO. I believe that the intensives, the intensive during the spring breaks are very, very important. I would uh, advocate for the, uh, the survival of intensives. I also believe that we, uh, believe that we need a, a, a better transparency between the VP International and the Student Affairs and, um, and a increase in the use of technology throughout campus. Uh, with, along with that, I believe that I can bring a new perspective to the SAC. I believe that my um, my um, I believe that uh, I believe that our priority should be the students of today, not only the students of tomorrow, and that we should make it a uh, clear priority in our projects of the years. Up coming. Thank you. I believe that the SAC's role is strictly to represent all the students of Mount Allison. So I believe that um, I believe that making sure that all students are represented is very important of the SAC. I just need to, uh, good communication is very important. We need to make sure that not only on campus students are represented, but also off campus. We need international students to be represented. We need all every minority of the school to be represented. So I believe that communications is very important. So not only word of mouth, but the SAC needs to uh, work very hard on making sure that every student is properly represented. Um, it's 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 I guess the the never ending question that's not going away, um, and it never will go away. Sound like it playing this question that should. Um, I, I think if you want to if you want to give students an increased voice, then you need to um, increase the actual role for them. Um, one thing that we're looking at this year, and something that I'm very into, uh, is looking at council structures. So uh, there are some there are some councils where they will have liaison counselors for things like women's issues, things like uh, international students and accessibility affairs. And those students actually have a seat on council. Um, they may or may not be voting members depending on the structure, but they have a, a voice right there on council to bring. Uh, uh, the needs of particular constituents forward. Um, so, like I say, it's something that our operations committee this year is actually already looking at. Um, but that's something that I'm very, very interested in is looking at 
uh, different, uh, I guess, different how different demographics can be represented at Mount A, um, and how different models can can work for the demographics demographics of students we have right here. Um, so I think that's I think that's probably the most substantial opportunity, or at least it's one that I'm uh, in favor of. Um, would be would be increasing uh, and, and I guess formalizing uh, the voice of, of those students from different demographics right on our council. Um. I guess what I think is that for those, uh, there are always going to be the students that really want to be involved in student government and there are the students that don't really care. And I think for the ones that don't really care or not involved, there's still a lot of things that the SAC can do for them and that's by implementing um, services that are going to benefit them, like upgrading technology and ensuring that there is a full-time career counselor who can actually help students find summer jobs, um, plan out their program, plan, plan out the degree, choose classes, and things like that. Um, for those students who maybe are shy and don't know how to be involved in the SAC, I think I would work with the VP of Communications to help make sure that the website is updated regularly, have um, the students be aware of who the SAC members are, wear their t-shirts more often so people know who to approach with their concerns, have um, meet and greets regularly, so and have the office be more welcoming and opening, open to all students. Okay. <coughs> all right, uh, so we have now a final one minute response in the chamber here uh, I believe that Mount Allison was such a high percentage of international students, and not only that, but there's students that come from such a large variety of countries. I think it's important to deepen the, uh, the network of international representatives and not only have one but maybe a bunch from different countries so that's on the international side of things but mainly I'm going to go back to my communications point that I believe that is a communications job to reach out to every student of Mount Allison. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly do think communication is important as well. Um, I mean, I think I think when you talk about representing students, um, the way that you represent students is through your policies, um, and so that's that's the point of policy is it's meant to express the views of of all students. Or uh, in particular instances when you're talking about things like financial aid, you want to express the views of students who need financial aid the most, and that's somewhere where a position based on policy and research um, will actually have the time to seek out the information and. Uh, appropriately consult with those students. So uh, I think again it comes down to good research uh, is the foundation of good policy um, and, and the other thing to consider I think is giving those students a more substantive voice on council uh, and that's something that uh, that I'd be very open to discussing um, once once we conduct our review this year that's going on in our operations committee. Alright, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our second question then. Uh, Rebecca will respond to this, this question first. Uh, and it is, as a member of the Board of Regents, how do you balance the needs of students and of the university? Jacob. 
So as a member of the Board of Regents, I believe that it's very important to stay equally on both sides. So um, target, uh, target conflicts on both sides of things, so both on the student side and on the Board of Regents. So uh, currently we've had issues such as the, uh, the Don's contract, and the Memorial Library come up. And those are instances where you really have to make sure that you're representing students properly, but that you also come back to the students with the proper information to be able to explain to them properly why they're doing so and why the projects are happening. And I believe that this transparency between the Board of Regents, the university, and the students is what's most important to the students here at Mount Allison. Thank you. Um, it, it's an interesting question because any time that you're around a table where there are uh, different interests being represented, it, it, I guess is a way to put it, um, there's, there's a conflict between um, autonomy and altruism. So, um, for example, the student representatives on the Board of Regents, am I there only to represent student views exclusively, or am I there to bring student views into a conversation about how this university functions on a broader level? Um, and, and I prefer the second view. Uh, I think that the real uh, reason that we're there is not simply to uh, say this is exactly what students want, students disagree, et cetera, et cetera, and, and fight back in that way. Um, we're invited there because, because student opinion is respected and student opinion uh, is needed to help the university steer its decisions. Um, so I think that absolutely you, you keep the interests of students at heart, of course. Um, and, and I think that uh, keeping in mind what's best for students um, is actually oftentimes uh, not as much in conflict as what's best for the university. Um, I think if you if you ever were in an instance um, where uh, where, the, where there was a conflict or where there were views of students that were a bit difficult, um, then then it is a collegial enough body that that you can uh, express your views. I mean, uh, I've I've been in board of regents and, and said some pretty critical things um, that afterward in the meeting, uh, some folks from the board said, well that came totally out of left field, and some others said it was really good that you said that. Um, so I mean, I think as long as you keep student interests at heart, and keep in mind that the goal of having a student on the board, and the goal of the board in general, um, is, is to make sure that the institution that we all call home um, is going in the right direction. And I think it's, I think it's um, ultimately, what it comes down to is the reason that students are on the board um, is because, uh, I guess, the board and those that made the University Act that outlines the board, um, trust in student leadership to bring views up collegially and discuss them well. Um, so keeping those values in mind and doing what you know is best for students, um, I, I guess is I guess is how I achieve that balance. Um, I guess I want to add that um, I'm a little bit of a disadvantage to my opponents as they have already sat on the SAC for more than one year and I have not. So to be quite honest, I don't know 100% what the Board of Regents is all about, but I would ensure that um, I am not afraid to voice my opinion in a professional manner to uh, people of high importance involvement in uh, on a federal level and uh, make sure that their side of things is communicated to the students so that even if there's an issue that comes up and the students um, aren't in a they disagree or they're upset about it, at least they kind of understand where um, they're coming from. So basically, um, just to go over, the Board of Regents is basically one of the highest groups of uh, decision making here at the university. So they've got uh, a say, a say, they get to choose quite specifically what we do with property, what we're going to do. Basically, a lot of a lot has to do with money and legalities and that sort of stuff. But so it's really important to do as a member of the Board of Regents is you're there as an SIC member, so you have to represent the student. But as a member of the Board of Regents, you have to also understand what needs to be done at this school. The Memorial Library has to go if it's more financially feasible to get rid of the whole building. Then you have to understand that as a member that it has to be done. But it's also your responsibility as an SAC member to bring back the reasons, the specific reasons for why that is being done to the students so that everything can be understood and no conflict is sparked. Thank you. Okay, 
So the last question we are is Pat, Rebecca, and Jacob. And the question is, how involved should the president be in each vice president's por portfolio? Um, I would say uh, I would say involved, um, but not um, intrusively so. Um, at the end of the day, um, when it comes down to what the SAC is doing, um, as the as the CEO of the organization, um, the president is responsible for answering for anything that the SAC does. Um, so it's important that you know what your VPs are doing. You say your VPs, but they're not really yours, and so that's where kind of that conflict exists. Um, it's important to know exactly what VPs are doing, but at the same time, um, these people have been elected um, by their constituents uh, to go to go forward with their own mandate, and they have their own goals. Um, and so I think it's important to allow them the freedom uh, to succeed and to provide them all the support that they need, um, all the while making sure that you're uh, aware of what they're doing so that you can uh, provide your input, so that you can uh, respond to any questions, so that you know, so that you can help uh, solicit student feedback if you're speaking with students. Um, so I would say uh, it's important to be involved um, and, and to be engaged and, and know what's going on, um, but also important to let those people who are very talented and capable and have been elected because they are, um, to let them carry out the work and the legwork uh, on their own and to trust them to do so uh, successfully. Um, I think I would have to agree with Pat on that one. Um, like I said in my opening statement, the role of the president is to act as a, in a support position to all the VPs as they're the experts in what they're doing. Um, so, you know, I don't want to micromanage their projects, but I would, of course, have to be completely engaged and involved and aware of everything that they're doing so that I can support them and also keep them in check and make sure that they are completing the tasks that they are trying to do in an efficient and timely way. Okay, so as the chair of the executive committee, I believe that it would be my job not only to oversee the projects of the individual execs, but I believe that I should have a quite an important role, and I think that, uh, I'm trying blanks today, sorry. Um, I believe that it is important to be involved, but not too involved. It's important for an executive not to be focused on too many different projects, We'll be spinning in circles for a whole semester, two semesters if we do that. So I think it's important for the president to be making sure that everything is nice and condensed and that we're focusing on different uh, on the same project and so that we can uh, target different projects throughout the year more effectively. Thank you. Um, the, the way that I've heard the portfolio of president described is um, you kind of have to be uh, a generalist in everything and a specialist in nothing. Um, so you, you have to be able to be involved um, from as broad a plane as uh, CASA and the MBSA and the external level uh, to Senate and Senate committees uh, on the academic level um, to things related to campus life, to your organization's finances, to how you communicate with your members. Um, so you really do have to be involved with uh, the breadth of portfolios that are covered by all the executive positions. Um, and then, of course, the, the president has their own specific duties and can take on their own projects. Um, and so I think it's important to keep in mind that um, if, you, if you do want to uh, be heavily involved in one area or if you want to do something, then um, you also need to be, be sure that you're uh, devoting the appropriate amount of time uh, to, to the, breadth of, uh, the breadth of priorities and the breadth of portfolios that this act does cover. How involved should the president be? I go back to my first point. They should be involved, but not too involved. They should make it their own responsibilities. Go go out and do the exec's job. But once again, he should make sure that the exec is on track and that all exec together, together as an executive committee, are focused on specific topics so that we can be most efficient. Thank you. All right, and now we have closing statements, and I'll tell you the order. So I pulled the nice from there. 
sponsor and care about the high school. They're not sponsors though, but they should be the sponsor for saying that. Uh, first up would be Jacob, then Patrick, then finishing with Rebecca. So you each have two meetings. No great for there. Um, so basically, I believe that I would make a great president because I have the creativity to innovate new projects and also I have the determination to see them come through. I believe that I can bring a new perspective to the school and for the SAC, especially on the matter that I believe that the benefits of today's students are the school's priority and should be. Not saying that tomorrow's students are important because they will be today's students tomorrow, but I believe that today's students should definitely be our benefit. Thank you. Sorry, that was kind of obvious. Um, I would absolutely agree that today's students are important. Um, and so again, I come down to, down to what I hope to accomplish next year. Uh, I think if we want to advocate effectively for today's students, then uh, we need to create policy that's, that's founded on great research. Uh, and I think that needs support, so that's why I'd like to, to create some support for that. Uh, and I also think that we need to be more consistent in our communication so that students can access our services better. Um, I think that's, that's what it comes down to if we want to serve today's students uh, and also continue to serve tomorrow, certainly not at the cost of today's. Uh, th that's, that's what I would like to accomplish. Um, a after a year, those are, uh, I think, the areas where we really do stand to improve the most and where students do stand to gain the most. Um, so that's what I'd like to accomplish for the next year and uh, um, I, I guess I look forward to, to hearing from you and, and the, the rest of the campaign trail, as they say. Thank you very much. So I think there are so many creative and intelligent individuals here at Mount A, and in the past the SAC has pursued a lot of really great initiatives, but I really think that there is room for improvement, and I really think that students want to see results, and they want to see how their SAC has helped them and benefited them. So I really think that, um, although I have a lot to learn about the SAC, um, although you know I'm very determined, you know I think that I have the qualities that would make a good leader and you know help be a good like a strong leader that could you know manage a team and I think you know I have those qualities and I think that I'm just you know I'm really motivated and really enthusiastic about this role and I really you know I'd be honored to uh, lead the next year's Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you to our three candidates. So next up, we've got the, the three candidates for, or two candidates, sorry, for Vice President Academic. And uh, don't worry if you were looking to get more from those presidential candidates, they'll be back up uh, to do the famous lightning round at the end of the debate. It's gonna be a good one, electrifying. Um, <laughs> Placing things on there. No props. Does it mess up? Does it mess up the camera shot? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. If you don't need to, no props, please. <laughs> All right. For for our opening statements, hang on. Again, refer to the Scott's word and caramel. Okay. Uh, first up, we've got Kylie. All right, well, thank you for coming, everybody. It's great to see so many of you on a really cold, wintry Sunday night. And uh, thank you to the RBC for putting this on. I always say it's great to debate, so it's good to be here talking about the issues and uh, why we'd like to be your VP Academics uh, for next year. So my name is Kylie DeShastelin. I'm a second year student here at Mount A. I'm pursuing a double major, hopefully with an honors stacked on top of that in Canadian Studies and Sociology, and I'm doing a minor in Political Science, just to keep it fun. I'm currently the Assistant Don of Harper Hall. Love that role, love the leadership opportunity, love the collaboration, and living in the residence community is just fantastic. Um, I don't have to tell you that education is important. It's the reason all of us are here. It's the reason other things like residence life matters. If it wasn't for your academic experience, you wouldn't be here at Mount A, and this building wouldn't exist, and this entire fantastic community would not exist. 
As a student, your opportunities to raise your voice and to ask questions about your education are paramount to your success and to your enjoyment of that process. I would like to be that person who can be the liaison between you and the faculty, you and the SAC, you and the, you know, the university community at large about your academics, which are the heart of everything that you do here at Mount A. To that end, I have four sort of overarching points and things that I would like to implement next year. Uh, the first of which is to look at week-long intensive courses, to think about you know, what, what makes a course and uh, how can you get three credits, how can you enrich your learning experience, what opportunities do you have for that, implementing midterm qualitative uh, course feedback so that you can impact what happens in your classroom directly, adding a digital component to the uh, SAC use book sale so that we save trees and time, and then finally implementing a notes bank to promote the community learning that Mount A is founded upon. I look forward to your support. Hi guys, uh, as most of you know, my name is Paris Satija, and I'm running to be your Vice President of Academic Affairs on the SAC next year. I have been involved with the SAC from day one at Mount Allison, and I feel that now I'm prepared to be your Vice President of Academic Affairs. My most valuable experience came this year as Science Senator, where I, where I represent the needs of students at the Senate level, both within the committee meetings and the University Senate itself. I know that this experience was critical in getting me prepared to be your Vice President of Academic. As for my platform, I'd like to focus on three main things. One, increased quality of teaching at Mount Allison. Two, the better access to the education that we have here. And three, perhaps the most important, is to continue the progress that has been made by the previous Vice Presidents in this position. Thank you. So just to kind of clarify for everybody, the, uh, the three credit course that was not offered this year was, um, was because there was one course that was proposed and it, was, it never went through. So um, the continuous learning structure at Mount Allison has changed where there's no longer a department of continuous learning. It's now um, run through the deans and the department heads of each department. And so only one department you know, proposed one course and it didn't go through all the way. And that's why there was no course that was offered this semester. Um, having said that, however, Sorry, but having said that, there has been um, a, uh, the deans are meeting next month to decide what a course entails, and that's where uh, I think this question is coming from. Um, I believe that, uh, yes, the deans can talk about what a course should mean, uh, yes, the professors can talk about what a course should mean, but I also think that the students should have some sort of a say in what they think a course is as well. Um, whenever this, this meeting takes place and whatever comes to Senate, that's where the students will have their say in saying, okay, we agree with this or we don't agree with this. Uh, what do I think about uh, what a three credit course should be defined as? Uh, a course, in my opinion, is, has to do with just the learning process that happens throughout the course. And so uh, if you, you, know, you feel like, I should just, the number three, in my opinion, doesn't really hold a lot of value. Uh, and you, during one week, you could learn uh, so much that it could uh, you know, keep you going uh, for that one topic, and it could really engage you, and you could keep doing that topic for the rest of your career in Mount Allison. Um, or it could take you three months to do that, or it could take you four months, or it could take you two months. I don't think the time uh, really defines what a course is. I don't think uh, you know, doing three hours in a lecture every week defines what a course is. I think it has to do with the learning that comes out of that the time, uh, whatever it may be. This microphone is really awkward. I'm just going to put that in there. Um, Paris is absolutely right. That's where this question comes from. And I think it's actually a really interesting ideological debate. And I'm actually just really kind of energized by the prospect of even discussing it. I think what I can tell you right off the bat is that an assessment like this would happen um, on a departmental level. Because what happens in a biology classroom and in an English classroom aren't the same thing. It's not as easy as stamping a certain number of hours, a certain number of papers, labs, or tests on a course. It's got to be something that the department and the students work out together to decide what 
what's going to make a really enriching, challenging learning experience for students. To that end, it's not quantitative that we'd be looking at, it would be like a qualitative review um, in each course. And so I can tell you that I think the course should be defined in those terms, in qualitative terms. What are you going to get out of it? What does the curriculum actually look like? What are the provisions there that we're thinking about? Um, and who should set that definition? You, the students, the clients of this university, but also the department and the faculty who have years of experience um, and know students and know what works and know what doesn't. I think that the opportunity to have a week-long intensive course like that is really important because it provides other opportunities that you might not have in, in a conventional kind of four-month uh, course. So, yeah. Thanks, Heather. Um, I think what we just what, what, what just said here it makes a lot of sense, but I think uh, we gotta go back and just kind of get a bit of a reality check. And the reality is that um, you know we we can sit here and talk about this all day and say we think this should be a course, we can say this should be a course, but 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 where it all kind of comes through is somebody has to tell the university administration, somebody has to tell the department heads, somebody has to tell the deans, and they have to be able to do that comfortably, and you have to make your case. And so in having these discussions, I think it's important that we have our opinions, but at the same time, we do some research what what's happening in other institutions, what makes us different from other institutions, see if that's been kind of violated here. Um, and, then, and then with that information, go to the department heads, go to the deans, and see what they say about all these things. And just kind of make it known that this is our stance on it. So please take this into consideration. Yep, I think Paris and I are sort of lined up on this one. It's got to be collaborative. There's lots of different layers of people that need to be consulted on this, but I think that ultimately it's got to be the department and the students that work out what is going to mean, um, you know, an enriching, fantastic, three-credit, intensive, week-long course experience at Mount May. All right, and for our second question, we'll just uh, reverse the order so kind of answer first and then Paris. Uh, and that second question is, uh, what are your thoughts and what would your plans be regarding the co-curricular transcripts? Well, I did the International Baccalaureate program, so there was a huge volunteer component. I had to do 150 hours of different activities that fell into different categories. So I can tell you that a co-curricular transcript, which is um, basically when the university sets up some sort of department whereby your extracurriculars are documented, and so what at the same time at the end of your degree that you would walk out with an academic transcript, you'd also be looking at um, an extracurricular transcript. So what are the things that you've done and it's sort of audited by this third party to make sure that all of those things are valid and you can carry it with you. I think that there is value to them. I also think that it would cost a lot of money to put someone um, in that role at Van Allison because of how engaged our student body is. I think that most students um, want to be interest, or sorry, authentic and honest about what's on their resume. So I don't know that I necessarily see a pressing need to walk out with an official piece of paper that says what you did or didn't do. I think that in an interview those things would be assessed anyway. Additionally, the university is operating on a budget deficit for the first time in many years. So to talk about implementing what would necessarily have to be a full-time position in order to facilitate this for this active and engaged student body, uh, to put in that position and that time and that department is just financially something that we're definitely not looking at in the next year. So I think it merits further research, it merits further discussion, and of course student input. If it's something that you guys really think is important, then we need to hear about that and we need to make a decision from there. But at first glance, I definitely don't think that from a financial perspective, it's something that's feasible for the coming year. Um, I have a pretty solid stance on this. Uh, what's the harm? What's, what's the problem? Like, why not do a corporate transcript? Uh, yes, there will be a lot of details that have to be ironed out. Um, you know, you have to be careful that uh, certain things are in certain categories, certain things are not. Uh, but if you don't start, it's, it's not going to happen, right? Um, and I, I just don't see what the negative implications of it are. And so for that reason, I would be like, yes, let's do it. Um, you're saying money, but it's not our job to, to you know, to make money happen. Uh, in the last two years, we didn't have a curricular, or sorry, in the last, last two years, but we, two years ago, we got a career counselor. Uh, where did the money for that come from? I think if you take the right channels, talk to the right people, and do your right research, you can make it happen. If you look at the universe, uh, sorry, the New Brunswick um, economy uh, and, and the projections and stuff, 
But I just saw the, the budget uh, projections for 2000, till from now to 2015 at the last Senate meeting. Everything is on the downward spiral. If everything's on the downward spiral, it doesn't mean that we're just going to stop and be like, oh, there's no money, so let's not bring up anything. We have to do what we can. We have to take the right channels and you know talk to the right people and then do the best we can. Do the right research, talk to the right people. Um, we can't let money stop us, right? Like That's not what we're here for. Uh, yes, it'll be a major barrier. We have to make a good case. It's pretty much what it comes down to. I actually think that money can stop us and does stop us in uh, many specific circumstances. And when you're operating on a budget deficit like this, it's a question of you know things that you absolutely need and that must exist for your educational satisfaction and quality. And it's a question of wants that we can't necessarily fulfill. So I think in the next year, my plans would basically be to, to you know put out feelers. Is this something you guys want in future years? Is this a priority? Because I think that in this room we can agree that it would be perhaps an add-on, but definitely a lot fundamental to your academic experience here. So I would choose to focus on other areas that are closer to the heart of that. Thanks, Claudia. Um, are all the things that we have here, uh, you know, perfectly efficient? Uh, so they got me big on efficiency, by the way. Um, it's just I don't know why, but. So uh, is everything here efficient? No, it's not. So the, what you have to do is you have to, you have to look at how the university is, is, is running right now and say to yourself, okay, like, is this a service that you know, students pay for, tuition went dollars go into this? Is this really benefiting as much as a co-curricular co transcript could? Yes, I agree that you know, there are some things that you just can't mess with, and that's, that's right. You just can't mess with some things. But I, I still think that uh, you know, even if money is an issue, even this, that, the other thing, I think that we should definitely do the research Look into it, but look into it with our heart and saying that, like, let's just pretend that money is not an issue. Let's just, because that would, that's the way we're going to get our best, best work done. Because if we're like, oh, well, we don't even think it's going to happen, so let's just kind of take a, a dilly dally role and just kind of, you know, look at it, it's, it, it's not going to make it any better. I think we should always just think, think, think of things uh, from just a fully, I guess, optimistic, so to speak, perspective, especially at the first, uh, first try. So the next question is, is there a need for more study spaces on campus, and what would you do about it? Interesting question. Um, is there a need for more study spaces? Uh, in my opinion, personally, yes, there, there's a need, but I, I'm not sure if it's a pressing need uh, right now. Um, you know, Kali might take another view on this, and that's fine. Um, it just all depends on, uh, no, I'm just saying, it just all depends on uh, who you talk to, right? If you talk to, to you know, somebody who's in residence and they're in a, a room, the rooms around them are all the time, quite all the time, they're comfortably happy, so they're perfectly happy being in that room and just saying to themselves, this is fine for me, this is a good study space. You can talk to somebody else in another residence who's like, I always have to keep leaving, go to the lab, and then it comes to exam time and I can never find a table at the library. So I think it all kind of comes down to um, what do the students think? How many students want more study spaces? If one student wants more study spaces, then yes, you do the research into it. It, it, it doesn't all, some things in my opinion doesn't always have to come to the majority. If you know the majority of the students want study spaces, they should have it. Um, having said that, however, you have to kind of look at your numbers and see, talk to the students and, and get their opinion, especially for me where right now for me, I, I, I'm kind of both ways on the issues. It's, I, I don't know, to be honest. I've never had that problem myself, but you know, I, I was fortunate to live in a single room my first two years, and I did. And I'm living off campus in a uh, relatively quiet house, so I'm not the best guy to talk to about this. So that's where I would go out. <laughs> that's where I would go out and get opinions from everybody and, and just see what people are thinking. You know, cover the whole range of spectrum. Cover the salary residences. Cover off-campus students. Cover students living kind of far from campus. Cover students living really close. And so just kind of play by that ear. Um, for this question right now, like I said, I, if, if students think there should be more study spaces, then yes, let's do it. But uh, if students don't, then then that's that. <laughs> I think that in a case like this, it starts with uh, absolutely what the students think. Uh, I can tell you what I think, which is that probably we're doing okay insofar as study spaces, but that perhaps the existing ones could be better advertised and subsequently better utilized, particularly during exam period. 
Uh, but if you guys totally disagree with that and think I'm way off base, then obviously I would be receptive to those concerns. I know that our current VP Campus Life, Michael Watkins, is working to publicize building hours when different spaces like the WU are open and available for student use. And I know he's coordinating with different security personnel as to the actual closing times of various buildings. And that kind of information is absolutely what could facilitate better and increased use of existing study spaces. Because I know a lot of people, for example, who aren't aware that you could come and study in here or book a conference room uh, for a group project or for some quiet study time in uh, the Wallace McCain Student Center. And I know that the library is seen kind of as the exclusive option, but I would tell you that there are many other places, even the basement of Crabtree building, that can be really useful. So it begins with you guys, it begins with what you have to say, but I would tell you right now that we're probably doing okay, which is great from a budgetary standpoint as well, and that we can just emphasize and advertise current spaces and the ways that they could be better used. Um, sorry. Uh, if you don't mind, we have one uh, final question that we will do for because we've just been flying through the interest. So, um, the final question, and Kylie kind of will answer first and then Paris, uh, is should the university focus more on job training and preparation or uh, on education and making us more well rounded? that being well-rounded is job preparation and is job training. And I think that when you come to a small institution like Mount Allison, you're looking for a liberal arts education that's going to provide a foundational basis for further learning. If you're looking for specific job training, there are a plethora of other options, but none of you made that choice. You're here because you want to learn for the sake of it. You're here because you want small class sizes. You're here because you want this challenging, engaging experience. Would it hurt to have things like Scott York here to be a career counselor to kind of help guide you about your, you know, on your next steps and to provide extracurricular opportunities or learning opportunities abroad that might facilitate more training or preparation that's narrowed or specific? I say that's all good, and we have a lot of things that exist to do that. But do I think the point of a classroom is to funnel you right into a job directly after, particularly at an institution like Matt Allison? No, I don't. Job preparation is important, but we're here and we're learning for the sake of learning. You all knew that when you came here. It's why you're here. I'd say that's what Mount Allison is founded upon. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with Colleen on that one. Um, just one small point, I suppose, is, is I just, as I look at the question, I just see the word education, and then I see the other two as being encom encompassed in that word, uh, as it is. And so, an education is, in my opinion, um, a means of job training slash preparation. Um, it is also, uh, you know, something that makes us well-rounded. Uh, it's not exclusively what makes us really well-rounded, but it, it definitely is a major part. Um, where should the university stand on this, in my opinion? I think the university just, just, just should stand on what they're doing right now. I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as I, what a lot of what I've heard from a lot of people is, is people are uh, are happy with the experience that they're having in Mount Allison. Um, people uh, have little kinks that they, they want to kind of, so to speak, work out. Um, but people are happy. People there there are always things, especially as you get older and you go into second and third and fourth year, you'll, you'll start noticing a lot more things, and and you say to yourself, okay, uh, you know, what can we do to do this? What can we do to do that? And I think that's where the sax part comes in, uh, is to kind of just geared their energies towards the specific um, uh, issues that the students have. Closing statements. Harris, you're up first. So, uh, just in closing, uh, thank you, Kali, for coming. Thank you, the Argosy, uh, for organizing this debate. Uh, just, uh, I guess, FYI, so to speak, uh, there are resident speeches on th Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, there's a question and answer period where you can have your questions um, answered at the at Grace's on Thursday. Uh, but uh, just to kind of go back on on who I am and, and why I'm doing this. Um, I've been I've actually been involved with the SAC from literally day one at Mount Allison, um, and. And I feel like now that I am prepared to kind of move into an executive role, I'm going to my fourth year, I'm a Bachelor of Science student in Chemistry. Um, 
and, and I've, I've, I've seen the SAC grow, especially this year, more than any other as a science senator, which in my opinion is, is kind of a logical step to move on to, to vice president of academic, because a, a large part of your portfolio is to look after the six senators and oversee, um, you know, kind of guide them along the way of, of how they should be doing what they're doing and, and just kind of just a support system because you've done the position before. I know for me this experience is really valuable where Eric would always step in and say, I think you know you should think about this as well. Actually, you should think about that as well. So I think in, in terms of that, I think I'm quite prepared for this position. Um, and I believe I can uh, uh, fulfill the portfolio successfully and bring in some new ideas to the SAC and ultimately to the students. for coming. It's really great to have this opportunity to talk about how we feel about this university. And uh, I, I think what I can tell you is that academics matter to every single one of us. We are all students. I'm a student. I share many of your concerns and I will be receptive to all of them. I want to be that liaison, that approachable individual that you can come to with a concern. And I want you to know that it will be dealt with in a timely, attentive, thorough manner. That's who I am. That's in everything I do. I am inherently responsible. I make way too many lists. It's a lot to take in. They're color-coded. You're welcome to come and see them. Take some tips from me. Um, all that by way of saying, I would welcome the opportunity to represent you on the SAC as your VP academic. It is central to everything you do at Mount Allison. It is so important. But to that end, I want you to make an informed decision. So please check out my Facebook group. Uh, you can search Kylie DeChastelain. It was in the Argosy last week, in case you can't spell my last name. There's, you're not the only one who can't spell my last name. Um, so you can go and read that, you can read my platform further. Please reach out via email, text me, walk up to me on campus. Let's have a conversation about it. I want you guys to attend these speeches coming to Gracie's Cafe or a residence near you next week. And please, please, please get on your computers and vote January 31st and February 1st for Kylie as your VP academic. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have three candidates uh, for the position of Vice President of Campus Life. Uh, so we'll ask them to come on up. Uh, Hi, my start off with our opening statements. Um, first up we'll have Simon, then Nikki, then Brent. So Simon the nice one. Hello. Good evening all, thank you for coming. First I'd like to address the officials present at this debate. I'd like to greet Pat Joyce, our SAC president, and all the other SAC officials respectively, uh, members of the RBC for putting this on. Thanks for ruining my Sunday. <laughs> anyway, a bit on uh, who I am and why I'm here. <clears throat> I'm a second year uh, honors IR student. I'm currently uh, treasurer at Thornton House, uh, staff writer for the Argosy, and I'm a dedicated academic as well as president of the Mount Allison Outdoor Activities Club, vice president of the Golden Dragon Kung Fu Society. You also might have seen me around town selling hot dogs. <laughs> or we're making pizzas. Anyway, I just want to just come out by saying uh, if there's anybody in the last six months who's worked with campus life, it's me. <laughs> I've pretty much been ingratiated into all aspects of this campus. And I'll just get you started on my story. Two years ago this evening, I was a down and out kind of guy. Peter Mansbridge's face came to me like a beacon of light, graced across the cover of McLean's, and drew me here. <laughs> I wanted to go here. I wanted to go to the place where everybody smiled all the time. 
where it was always sunny and warm. Hell, I wanted to meet Peter Mansbridge. <laughs> anyway, I'll just carry on because I have 30 seconds. Following up on the incumbency of somebody like Michael Watkins, it's hard for me to criticize. Nay, standing on the shoulders of this giant, I wish to take off where this talented young man has left off. With the experience I've gained over the last uh, year and a half in residence, I plan to make this campus life position uh, the best it can be. And with all the experience I've gained, I'm going to work with this campus life and basically just use all my experience and make it uh, awesome. Thank you. Right there, but I'll try. So I'm Nikki Batia, I'm running for a VP campus life. Uh, a little bit about my background: I'm a physics math double major, hopefully in honors. Um, in terms of experience, I was on my high school student council. I was the president and founder of the board of education in my region in Ontario. Um, I'm in communications on the physics society, I'm on the debate team, I'm on the murals. So I'm involved in campus life, you could say. Um, I'm currently on the stack as an off-campus counselor, and this year I've actually achieved quite a bit, uh, thanks to the help of everyone on the exec and students in general. So I've, um, I did the whole campaign for the Final Performing Arts Center, getting student input. I learned a lot about communicating with students during that whole campaign, that whole project. Um, I'm currently working on partner, corporate partnerships to reduce student expenses, so that's like partnerships with cell phone companies or software companies so that our um, tertiary expenses are reduced. Um, I also was successful in getting us a healthy option, the vending machine. Woo, take a look at that. <laughs> Coming soon to a vending machine near you. Um, why am I running? Um, I'm tired of being marginalized. Um, I believe that if we're going to do well in our four years here at Mount Allison, there are four pillars that we need to focus on. That's academic, finances, health, and emotional well-being. Um, if we do better, then the university does better. And I know people talk about how the university is you know, on one side and the students on the other side, but I think we definitely have a common goal. And you know, my slogan for my campaign is live your best campus life, because in order for you to do well academically, you can't be worrying about your finances. You can't be worrying about you know, illness or like, do I have coverage for insurance? So, you know, my sort of uh, view as VP Campus Life is to take a holistic picture. How can we get student input? What is it that you guys want to see? How can I give you what you want? Um, that's where you should vote for me, for VP Campus Life. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name is Brittany Smith, and I am running to be your uh, VP Campus Life for the 2012-2013 academic year. Why am I running? Um, I can tell you I believe that I have the ideas, I have the passion, and I have the experience to be the best VP Campus Life next year. So firstly, a little bit about me, my experience. I have held leadership positions since I was 13 and the Prime Minister of my student government in my middle school. I thrive under pressure, I enjoy student government, I have held numerous positions, so I truly believe that if elected, I have the experience and I have the capability to hit the ground running and begin, because I understand how the staff works and I understand how student governance works. So, for example, uh, last year I had the honor of being the elected art senator on the SAC, and I thrived in this position. I very much enjoyed it, um, and I, I was really able to understand the workings of the university, and specifically with Senate, and see where the SAC is going in the future. Um, my ideas. I think that I have quite a few good ideas that would be beneficial to uh, campus life here. And so, after speaking with students and gauging where their interests lie, um, some of my ideas, some of your ideas, include things like fighting for a campus life budget, grocery delivery services, training clubs and societies to promote integration in the SAC, just to name a few. And finally, um, 
Last semester, I had the privilege of traveling abroad, and I got a lot of ideas uh, that I think could be implemented here. So I'll bring a little bit of an international perspective, because I want to enhance student life, I have the passion, and I want to be your next Vice President Campus Life. Thank you. Question. Uh, it will go Brittany, Mickey, and then Simon. The question is, how would you like to see food services evolve in the coming year? What, what would you do to see your desired changes happen? All right, so we all know that the block plan has gone away. And I know there are many off-campus students um, that would like to see the block plan be reinstalled into our system because I know personally there's um, a lot of there's a lot of great things that come from meal hall, uh, so social interaction, just to name one thing. But it's it's a huge benefit for students if they just don't have the time and they're on campus, they could go uh, grab a meal. Um, so essentially, with food services, I mean we are already pretty much number one in the country uh, with our cafeteria. Um, we have some great options at Meal Hall. You go to Gracie's, we've got some good options. I mean, we are trying to implement healthier options, which, um, as Nikki pointed out, is, uh, is, is coming to campus soon. Um, but in terms of changes, I mean, obviously, we're here to represent you. We want to hear your voice, and we want to get you what you want. So, in terms of seeing the desired changes, I think it's absolutely necessary um, that you're going to people like Gail Churchill, um, you know, who can help uh, for further uh, new initiatives um, such as this. But um, I think I think it's knowing who the correct people to speak with are, and also being able to target um, your audience and grasp from them what what we want uh, as a student body, and specifically with food services. But I mean, obviously. Uh, Obviously, decisions and opinions uh, are varied when you look at off-campus and on-campus. So it's also imperative to, to target all students. Um, okay, food services, hot topic. Um, my personal opinion is that it's currently too expensive for too much, but that's a whole other issue. Um, things that I just like to see, things that I've heard students say, there should be a meal plan in Gracie's. Um, which is a fantastic idea. Um, the cost of a sandwich is five dollars, five dollars a day for a month. That's eighty dollars a month. I think off-campus or on-campus students would be willing to get a Gracie's meal plan. Um, I think it's time to start a dialogue with the university in terms of finances and what our meal plan options are. That being said, let's enter reality. The 150 block and the 300 block was just cut off. There's a reason why they cut that off. And personally, like Pat Joy said. The student union is separate from the university, and I say it's time to start looking for solutions outside of the university. One of my big ideas, it's sort of lofty, I'm not sure, I still need to get student input, but one of my big ideas is how about a Sackville downtown plan? Let's get all the businesses together, get a meal plan, students can pay into, they have a card, they can go to Pickles, Joey's, Jack's, you know, see what they can get in terms of food that's downtown, because uh, I mean, we're separate from the university as a student union. Um, in terms of desire changes, if we're not going to go, if we're not going to dream big, let's get healthy. Let's at least, you know, make sure that we're healthy, we're working hard, and that we're able to sort of, you know, push toward the same goals financially and in terms of health and fitness. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Getting back to block meal plans. Right now, as Treasurer Thornton. I've been on the front lines of this bit of vicious repealing of the meal plan policy. A policy which was agreed upon almost 10 years ago and uh, was known as the Thornton Experiment, more or less. Thornton House is given two kitchens on every floor. Uh, and as well, along with the satellite residences and off-campus students, there was a type of block meal plan created. Uh, there were several options. 140 was popular as well as a 300 block plan. And personally, before coming here, uh, somewhere, you know, after I saw Peter Mansbridge's face, I said, hey, I'm going to go live in Thornton and cook my own food. So I bought $300 worth of cooking supplies only to find out they had just, uh, two months later, they had taken it away. I mean, I, and I, I couldn't then, and I still can't afford almost $4,000 a year uh, to, to eat a meal hall. 
Uh, it's too much, and I don't think our choice as students should be taken away once we move off campus. I mean, how else are off campus students going to stay involved and ingratiated with the Mount Allison community if they can't even come to Jennings for a meal without paying four thousand dollars? That just doesn't it doesn't make sense financially. It doesn't make sense because people want to buy these block meal plans and they simply cannot. Um, I, I, last year there were a few off-campus students who hung around, now there's almost none. I mean, they might come in to pay for one meal, but no one, I've seen almost no one on a, on a meal plan options that they have right now. They need to be changed, and in Thornton, people are moving out, and the satellites as well, I've seen, I've heard similar things. People don't, like in this weather, people don't want to trudge uh, all the way to meal hall and then you know, they come and then just leave and they got to come back two hours later. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, we need the block meal plans back, not just for the satellites and Gordon, but for off-campus students as well. I intend to get that done. Um. So when we talk about um, bringing the, meal, the block meal plan back, um, I think it's a discussion for sure we should definitely have, why not? Um, I think when we're going to talk to the university in those kind of terms, we need to come to the table informed and well-researched. Um, I actually just recently learned that uh, meal hall was just paid off, so the building's paid off, which means that now they're currently running on already costs. So, I mean, that changes the, t that changes the whole game in terms of finances, so I think if not that the university is trying to take advantage of us, but that if we do our research and we have the numbers and we have a formalized way of communicating the students' needs to the university or to Meal Hall, um, I guess, yeah, to Jennings, um, I think we can definitely start a discussion, but I definitely think that in terms of food services, there's a very, very, very large room for improvement. Right, so one of my first projects at Thornton House Treasure was to get the block meal plans back, find out why we don't have them anymore, and what can we do to get them back. I met with Michael Watkins, and we determined that uh, petitions wouldn't convince Michelle Strain. Uh, I met her, uh, tried to speak with her on this issue. Uh, she's not very receptive at this point, but as Nikki mentioned, uh, they just paid off Jennings. Now, I'm not sure what happened, meeting with Michael Watkins, it seemed like a very sketchy meeting that went down between him and her where she was basically just like, this isn't gonna change. Now that meal plan has been paid off into whatever hands have been made for the university, my guess is they were forcing us all to buy an unlimited meal plan so they could pay off Jennings. And now that that's done, they're more willing and more receptive to getting the block plans back. I think it's very possible, especially now in the current financial situation, that that the school's in, they paid off meal hall, they don't need people to buy these $4,000 meal plans, I think it's ridiculous. And I think it's very possible to get that done, and that's going to be one of my top priorities to get that done, to get the block meal plans back. Can I add a question? You know, I can't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, our second question, uh, we'll go with Nikki, Simon, the, the, the um, second question is, is there a need for increased security on campus? Um, I would rephrase this question and say that there's not a, a need for, like before we even answer this question, there's a, a pre-question that says, um, we need to do, well, a statement, we need to do research to determine what's going on on campus. Um, I know currently that uh, Mike Watkins is uh, putting in a proposal for a grant uh, for approximately $2,000, $200,000, which would finance a summer student to do an internal review um, of the security measures at Mount Allison, and that would also fund you know, an external company to, uh, to do sort of like a third party unbiased uh, review of our security measures. Um, at first glance, I could definitely see holes. I think we definitely need a walk home program. I think the nightlife in Sackville is, uh, is bumping. So, you know, a lot of people are walking home. A lot of people live, I mean, you're drinking, you probably don't have a car, you're a student. How are you gonna get home? You're a female, you know, your friends have ditched you, sometimes it happens. Um, you know, there, there's a whole, you know, area of gray here. So at first glance, I would say, yes, there's a need for increased security on campus. What that means, I'm not sure. What students specifically require, I'm not sure. 
but it's a great opportunity to do some research, you know, like, uh, let's, let's get talking, let's, uh, let's find out what the needs are, um, and uh, we'll go from there. <coughs> Okay, is there any for increase in ser uh, security on campus? Yes. <laughs> um, during a dramatic group presentation in my women and gender studies class last term, we discovered that 95% of calls made to the SHARE uh, helpline, which is a sexual harassment assault uh, response, uh, an education uh, a center uh, went straight to voicemail. Uh, there's nobody responding to these issues. There's there's over 14 sexual assaults in sac uh, the change from our area uh, last year alone. I'm giving these guys a lot of but and this is an issue that we need to tackle. There, we need to get this walk home program done. Standing on the shoulders of giants, Michael Watkins has done awesome work. He's almost got this thing implemented. He did a test run in Windsor. Not many people used it, but I still think there is a need for it. Uh, I still think it should be available. I think a security escort should be available for anyone, not just young women, anyone who's vulnerable, anyone who needs it, young women included, of course. And to walk them home, the SAC has also talked about a drive home program. Um, kicking that idea around through meetings and interviews I've conducted with the SAC. Uh, they determined that possibly buying a car and doing a drive home program for students who live off campus would be feasible. And I would like to see that happen. I think that's a good idea because <laughs> even if you leave the, the pub in a group, sometimes it gets split up. Friends did too, I guess. And a drive home program would work. It's cold. People need to get home. There's a lot of other dangers. You get slipped. You're wearing heels. You get stuck in one of the boards. You're just going to crack your head open and you need to ride home. Uh, the share help, the share hotline is one of these things. I'd like to see a volunteer uh, helpline if there's the need for that. Of course, uh, we have to look into that. Uh, but I, I do think there's a need for increased security on campus. Well, number one, it is the school's ultimate responsibility to ensure that all of its students are safe. So, in fact. There is security currently in place uh, at Manet, and we know we have two security, full-time security guards. However, I'm sure that the level of safety um, among every student differs. Um, I know for a fact that there has, there has been unfortunate situations that have occurred on campus that have not been reported um, for various reasons. And so, as much as I'd like to say, you know, students are secure on campus, I think there's always room for improvement and there's always room for more. Um, yes, it is a financial responsibility and a little, you know, it's a financial burden for the university to um, increase its security. However, I don't think this is, this is a, an issue that can just be overlooked and, you know, skimped on essentially. Um, and I know I have talked to Mike uh, Watkins about his grant, his $200,000 grant, which would be amazing. Um, Hopefully that comes through, hopefully. <laughs> um, but I think something that would be really helpful um, would be to have some kind of, I, I, know, I know there are questions uh, being posed to students about their level of safety. However, I think an anonymous online survey would be very valuable because safety is not something that students constantly want to be open about, you know, and be public about. So I think having it being anonymous would be extremely valuable and we would get the true, um, opinions of students um, to ensure that their safety is being met. And as it's already been mentioned, the walk home program um, is potentially going to be implemented. I think there's a lot of potential for a drive home program. I think it is feasible. Many of the universities are looking into it, specifically St. FX, which is relatively close to our population size. But I think security is very important and it's always been an issue for the Campus Life VP. So I think this is not something that's going to you know, disappear next year, but I think there's always room for improvement. Um, so a second glance at this question. Um, it's not just a you know, girls walking home from the bar issue. It's a, it's a theft issue. Um, it's a, you know, extended study hours, just securing your belongings. Um, that's all encompassed in security. So, um, you know, I don't think it's black and white in terms of what security is. And I don't think 
it's black and white in terms of you know just hiring more security guards. Um, it does. It definitely does not have to be a financial issue with things like the Green Dot campaign, which is you know they want to promote awareness and knowledge so that as a community we are we increase our level of security for each other. Um, so I think through initiatives like that, it, it definitely doesn't need to be a financial issue. Um, and um, there is a need for increased security on campus. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate re once again, I think the SHARE uh, Center is a great place to start. Right now, I'd, I'd like to see their staff grow from one to more than one person and potentially get a volunteer helpline uh, going there for people in these crises. Also education. Uh, Melody uh, Petlock, who runs the, the SHARE Center of Sexual Harassment Assault Response and Education Center. I'd like to see her go around do more education, educating everybody on their safety, finding out where they feel unsafe, why, how this can change, and uh, more awareness tips for just everybody going out. Sackville can be a sketchy town sometimes. And uh, I'd, I'd like to see increased education in that aspect on security issues. Um, I just thought something that I think could be really uh, useful and really beneficial would be some kind of educational program during or frosh orientation. Because you know, you always think, what do you new students want to hear about? What do they need to hear about? And uh, I think sack, Sackville safety, that could work. Um, you know, how to go about being safe in Sackville, who to call. I know a lot of students are constantly questioning who they go to with certain issues. Um, when I, when I have some more time to speak about my actual platform, I'll, I'll bring this issue up. But I think um, in terms of security, I think it's also very important that students know who they can go speak to when it's not just a security guard. And there have been initiatives, uh, well, Pat Joyce tried to create the helpline. Unfortunately, it wasn't feasible last year due to uh, space restrictions. However, due to the fact that some initiatives haven't been able to be implemented, I think that's an even bigger issue as to why um, why security needs to be enforced. And I think frost orientation would be an amazing uh, outlet for this to happen. <laughs> okay, for the last question, the order will go Simon, Britt, and then Nikki. The question is, what value do students get from membership with the Canadian Organization of Campus Activities, otherwise known as COCA, or as well as from attending the conferences? Well, I knew there was one question that was basically going to be the RMC term screw with us and see if we get our homework, but um, I actually have no idea what that is, sorry. So, good job, Alex. <laughs> 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 uh, can you tell me what COCA stands for? The Canadian oh. Organization of Campus Activities. All right. Um, specifically, I do not know the main points as to what uh, a student with a membership with COCA would be, um, but it, because it's campus activities, I would assume that the people attending these conferences are learning about various campus initiatives um, on, univer on universities across the country, um, across Canada, um, and specifically these people attending the conferences are bringing them back to Mount Allison and uh, conveying the messages that they heard at the conference um, in the hopes that it will benefit students at Mount A. Um, so specifically, I would say that the average student, um, I would consider myself a very engaged student here at Mount A, um, probably isn't aware of what their membership with COCA is providing them with. However, um, I'm positive, considering the fact that Mount A is a member, or Mount A students are members, that we are benefiting um, because there'd be no reason why we would be members of COCA if we weren't getting benefits. Um, so I don't know. Here's um, so I have an actual uh, specific opinion on this. Um, I personally don't think we should continue to be members of COCA. Um, I definitely think we should continue to be members of CASA. Um, in terms of COCA, from what I can understand, it's um, it's given us some financial benefit in terms of reduced fees and whatnot, but it just, I mean, I've only been on council for this year, but from what I understand from the research, 
Um, it doesn't seem as, as effective in terms of the, the amount of fees and the amount of money that, that uh, executive members have to spend to travel uh, to COPA conferences. So um, at first glance, from what I've experienced with COPA through this year, through presentations by Pat and Mark, um, I would have to say I don't. Th I'm not. I'm not for continuing our membership. Yeah. Um, so I think Britt's uh, response is pretty good. That's probably the kind of impromptu thing that you should be known for. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of talk. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> if it's if it's redundant, cut it. I feel like this is more of a UP external question. Could be wrong. Uh, but if uh, yeah, if you guys want to see me go to Coco, I'll go. Um, as I pointed out, in my initial speech, I was studying abroad for the past semester. Um, in the Netherlands, so I definitely got a perspective on what student life can be when you're abroad. However, I do know um, what what these uh, national conferences are somewhat about, and although there are you know high fees um, revolving these conferences, I do think getting a national perspective on issues and events and activities that are affecting Canadian students is very important. I mean, we are a small university. We're not constantly being faced with the issues that you know other students around the country are being faced with. So I think, in a way, it you know broadens Mounty's perspective, which is a very small university. We're one of the smallest, and so I think it brings greater perspective and provides us with the opportunity to have other initiatives um, brought forth to Mount A. So I think, as much as as much as this may be a financial burden, and you know we could cut some costs, I think because we are such a small school, having a national uh, a national and broader perspective on things can bring a lot of value to Mount A, the SAC, and the everyday student. Um, I would agree with with Bert that um, you know we definitely need to be aware of you know what's happening at the universities and. and you know, keep the interconnectedness of you know university and maritimes and what they're doing, but I, I don't see why you know paying a membership fee to Coca, you know, supersedes hardworking executive members putting in the research. I mean, at every council meeting, it's like, well, I have a friend in Santa Fe, I have a friend in Dal, I'll call them, I'll call them, figure out what's going on. Um, I really don't see any value in continuing the membership. Thank you for those answers. Um, so now we're going to move on to our closing statements in the order. Again, to the Scott's Ferns, delicious caramel ice cream. Uh, we'll go with Nikki first, then Britt, and Simon first. Um, okay, so I think after this debate, it's, it's obvious that we have three, you know, experienced candidates, hardworking candidates. Um, at the end of the day, VB Campus Life is is sort of this broad portfolio that sort of listens to what the students want and sort of can advocate for what students need in the here and now. Um, what do I bring to, to the table? Um, I think I'm very hardworking. I think I'm, uh, I'm very good at getting my research done. And I think I'm, what's also key is I've worked with Michelle um, with a healthy food uh, and vending machine campaign and that is successful, that's going to move forward. I think I am very good at um, maintaining relationships with administration members in the university um, and I think that's what this position is all about in order to be effective. Um, in terms of me towards the university, I think I have, I have strengths that sort of work that angle and then in terms of collecting information from students, um, when I did the Final Performing Arts Center uh, student input uh, research uh, campaign, call it, um, you know, sitting down with students, the one thing that overwhelmed me was that they are full of, you know, eloquent, intricate ideas, and they just don't know how to get them done. And I would love to be that person that can take the ideas from the students, get them done, take them to university, and at the end of the day, I feel as though the university and 
campus life have the same goals, but they need to be presented to the university in a way that's fiscally responsible and you know, benefits student needs. And so I believe that if you choose me as your representative as you campus life, that will be done next year. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate you taking the time out of your Sunday night. I mean, it is getting late. But um, I think the main points that I want to leave you here, leave with you here tonight, are the fact that I enjoy student governance. I always have. Um, I started out when I was 10, and I'm now 20. So 10 years going, I'm still involved, and I still want to be involved. My second point is I do have the experience. I have a resume that is too long. Um, based based on what I have done in the past, uh, you can all go check out my platforms on my Facebook page that's coming out tonight. Um, and I also want to be in this position. I really think that there needs to be um, new life put into student life here. And we all know that your university experience is shaped by your student life here. And I know that based on the ideas that I'm bringing, and the ones that you have already told me that you want, I think I can get the best job done and enhance your student life the way you want it because I want to represent you and voice your needs and voice your concerns. So thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for debating with you. This is a lot of fun. I'd just like to thank again the SAC officials who are present at the RBC for putting on the debate and everybody who came out. I'm just going to go over my platform quickly since I didn't have time to do that at the beginning. Uh, my platform is SCARF, S C A A R F, that's Security Clubs, Athletics, Administrative Services, Residence, and Facilities Management. So the, all these things I have covered basically in my platform. Tonight, I thought we were going to get a chance to basically talk about what we wanted to talk about. Fortunately, we didn't as much as I'd like to, but you guys can come out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and see uh, my whole platform. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the videos out by now and uh, Facebook, me at Simon G. Murray on Facebook, or S-M-U-R-A-Y at if you'd like to email me any questions. Just in closing, I'd like to say whether it's clubs or societies, uh, working with the, the administration, Gail Churchill's a personal friend. Legal <laughs> <laughs> uh, hall issues, or just big issues affecting constituents in the Mount Allison community. I've worked in almost every aspect of campus life and of the, the platform and things that I want to see get done. Um, and have the confidence necessary to make those changes that I mentioned happen. So, I'll let you count your vote. It's going to be fun. See you guys on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. That's fun. Just on the it doesn't matter. All right, thank you to our three candidates for Vice President of Campus Life. Um, They'll also be back for the lightning round. I don't know if we're going to have uh, sound effects for that. Last but not least, you might want to turn around at the doors when you hear who's coming up next. Uh, we've got the vice president external candidate. Um, he's going to debate himself. Here we go. <laughs> You'll have two minutes for your opening statement. I brought two of me up here to uh, debate myself. Um, anyways, uh, again, sir? Uh, good evening, Mounties. Uh, thank you for coming out and staying with us. Uh, on the tail end of a telethon, it feels like. Um, I'm not good with time limits. I hate them, but that's okay. I'm here for fun. Um, my name is Sean McGilley, and I want to be your Vice President External. Not, a, not only am I the only option, uh, uh, but I have the experience, dedication, and I'm a very approachable guy. Uh, and I, these are all traits that are required to, uh, for someone to be your vice president external, and I will do it well. Um, I have three target areas that I really want to focus on. Um, Something that's very critical to me, I think, is more internships and mentorship programs for students at Mount Allison. 
Yes, it's a liberal arts education, but there's nothing unparalleled than there is to an internship in an office that can eventually lead to that million dollar job. Let's face it, we all want it at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> And a second thing that's critically important to me is off-camping housing and education. Uh, we need to reinvigorate our forum. We need to add, add a frequently asked questions page. Um, because I knew nothing about moving off campus. And, you know, my landlord could have raped me and I wouldn't have known. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, uh, I, we need to pursue more avenues for student input in the greater Sackville community because we are a core community in Sackville uh, that needs to be represented. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few questions um, that you can um, debate yourself on. Uh, so, I guess you're going to be going first. Uh, here's your first question is uh, what provincial advocacy efforts should be central to the NBSA? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and uh, it's ironic because the MBSA essentially, for all of you that know, is the New Brunswick Student Alliance is supposed to advocate for us to the provincial government. Well, in reality, it's a defunct organization that's doing absolutely nothing for us because they're not meeting. So, the priority effort of the MBSA should be for it to start meeting once again. Uh, and that would be something that would be core to my platform. Uh, so to begin with, I think, uh, obviously, I was at the Senate meeting recently, and uh, we're looking forward to a 2.5% increase in tuition, and, and that's best case scenario, primarily. So we have that to look forward to. So for those who, those who cannot afford our tuition, which is fairly high, uh, is, well, highest in the country, pretty much, um, it should be that we reinvigorate the financial aid program within the province so that we can see those that with lower incomes being able to afford university education. Because costs are going up, a tuition freeze is not sustainable, and if you haven't looked at the economic outlook for the province, it's not good. It's not good at all. Be lucky if it's still here, uh, but that's an exaggeration as well. Uh, but truly, we need to reinvigorate the financial aid program. That is my one and key priority for the NBSA, and that it needs to start functioning again for students in the province. The next question, what federal advocacy efforts should be central to CASA? Uh, um, well, CASA is, 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 is a bit of a monster to me, which I hope to grapple soon. Um, but uh, some key concerns for CASA should be, uh, in my opinion, again, is focusing on those that are disenfranchised from post-secondary education. And I know we're seeing significant traction recently in First Nation uh, accessibility to uh, to uh, post-secondary institutions, such as Mount Allison, where we have a very small uh, First Nation community represented here. And I think through programs initiated by the federal government, we can see a more diverse uh, student population, which, believe me or not, as controversial as it may sound, it truly does improve everyone's education with a diverse background of people coming to a school like Mount Allison. In addition, uh, to be quite honest with you, something that CASA recently passed that isn't very important that is uh, the car tax. I, I mean, to be, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, if you have a car that's worth under $7,000, you, you get some sort of tax break on it. I'm not clear on the details. <coughs> but anyways, that's not a priority. Priority should be in, in enhancing Again, those disenfranchised groups access to post-secondary education. Now, I have to be honest with you, I, I have to be, I need to look more at what CASA is working on to give you a better and informed answer as to what key principles CASA should be advocating for, and I hope to do that uh, if elected. Thank you. Um, Th 
third question is, are students getting value for their investment in the NBSA and CASA? <laughs> Touchy. Um, well, I would have to say, without restructuring the NBSA, we should leave the NBSA. I mean, uh, again, I'm not comfortable with giving you a decisive figure on what we pay into it. I, I, I know it's around $3, but I think we've taken a decrease because they don't have an executive director right now, so we're not really doing anything. Um, but uh, in all honesty, if we do not see value in the NBSA shortly, we should leave. Uh, it's an institution that's broken. Uh, in a meeting with Mark today, I, and in council recently, uh, Mark Coker, current VP external, uh, there are schools that are submitting budget submissions that are part of the MBSA, which are undermining the budget submission done by the MBSA. So unless we can get all the members of the MBSA to agree on one budget submission, only then will we start to be taken seriously by the provincial government. So that's, that's kind of my answer to that one. And for CASA, I truly do think we are seeing our value for our money. We're having unparalleled access to legislators in Ottawa and political actors in Ottawa that have been essential. Um, <laughs> with more work, I think we'll get uh, what we want more. Um, yeah. What will the SAC involvements be in municipal elections in May 2012? Good question. This is something that's fundamental to, uh, I think, this platform. And that is something uh, Stephen's acutely aware in our external affairs meeting the other day. Uh, we need to bring more student involvement into the municipal elections. And I think that's only done through one means. It's cliche, but it works. Multimedia works in attracting students two core issues. So I, and the committee was endorsed it, I think we need to give the opportunity for candidates that are running for mayor and counselor in this town to have access to students. Whether that be a 30 second clip that you can watch while you're supposed to be studying or not, uh, you know, you're having access to that. I think what we also need to do is make it clear, uh, maybe it's an online document, maybe it's an email, maybe it's simply sitting at a table in a meal hall or in the student center and telling you, if you're interested in voting, how do I go about it? How, can I vote as a student if I'm here in May? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, many people don't know that. Um, but the SAC's involvement also in the municipal election, I think also critical, is that we're a large population in the town and that our, uh, our priorities should be represented by the candidates, make them acutely aware that we're interested in being part of their community, and we do not want to be disenfranchised. So I think it'll be key for me, uh, along with other members of the executive, to continue the ongoing relationship with the town to ensure the students' uh, wants and needs are still priorities of the town. Because we, in all honesty, have a better relationship with the town than the university does. Um, maybe because that's we take them seriously, but that's a whole other point. Um, yes. That's my long little answer. Thank you, Sean. Uh, those are our questions. Um, thank you for debating yourself. Um, so we'll give you two minutes if you would like for a closing statement. Oh. Or you can wrap it all up. Can I water? Perhaps. <laughs> Um, so, you haven't gotten sick of me yet. Um, please vote in the affirmative for Sean McGilley, Vice President External, on January 31st and February 1st. Not simply because I'm the only candidate, but truly for my desire to represent you on the issues and make the Students Union the best it can be externally. Tackling key issues such as off-campus housing and education, a closer connection between the union and career services, uh, hopefully that works, and to continue and expand our excellent relationship with the town. Um, while always advocating for Mounties, their interest to all levels of government. Hope McGilly. <laughs> Thank you, Sean.
Sean, and now for what everybody's been waiting for, we'll invite all the candidates to come up to the front where we will engage in the ever exciting whitening round. Yeah. No. Well, that was <laughs> all right, just so everybody knows what's going on here, is we've got all our candidates up here, and we're going to ask them uh, questions, and they give quick 30-minute responses. Did you say 30 minutes? Oh my god, we'll be here forever. 30 seconds, please. Just 30 seconds. All right, so what we'll do is we'll start down on the left with uh, Jacob and work our way down. All right, so our first question in the lightning round. If you had to cut a SAC service, what would it be? The ones that aren't being used at the moment, to be honest. Um, walk home. Um, to be honest, I would have to be really in office to, be under to know what service is not being used. Uh, at the moment, I kind of know which ones are input. Um, to be honest, be the ones that are not being used and that aren't benefiting the students at the moment. I would probably have to say the condom service. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it, I, for now, the university continues to provide condoms. I, it will be ending shortly, but we're kind of duplicating a university service that's already there. Um, I think if that service is eventually suspended by the university, I think we should look at it again. But I don't see why we're handing out condoms and the wellness department's handing out condoms. And I didn't know until recently, you can go to the Tantramar Hospital and get condoms. So I mean, there's three providers of condoms in the community. I think it's enough. Uh, um, all right, good point. <laughs> um. This is a tricky question, and off the top of my head, I can't really think of a specific SAC service that, that I would cut, but um, I would definitely consider you know, going along the condom front. Um, things that the SAC is giving away that are not um, being utilized, and then taking those resources and putting them somewhere else, obviously. So that's sort of my general answer. Uh, and <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. A service that's actually cut, again, it would be something that students are not using. Uh, currently, um, the condom service seems to be a little overdone at the moment, so I would say to cut that currently. Uh, I know it sounds like a cop but it's <laughs> all right. <laughs> this, is, this is a tough question. Um, if I had to cut one, um, I would say not necessarily cut, but, but divert funds from uh, the residence grant that we have, not because it's not a great service, because it really is, but it has not been used the way that we hoped for it to be used. Uh, and the other, the other aspect of that is that that's money coming from all students on and off campus that's only going back to resident students. Um, I guess when it comes to another service, uh, I think that the, uh, the test bank is something that um, shouldn't be cut, but I think that we do need to change a focus, and I do like very much the idea of changing that to something more like a note bank, because then you don't have as many problems with intellectual property. Um, yeah. I would say seven Mondays. Um, it's given out uh, every year, and it's put in your mailbox, and you, most students don't read it, don't know what it is, uh, don't know what's inside it, and I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's talented work inside, but I don't think, I think there needs to be more publicity for it, for it to be uh, valued, but if that's not going to happen, I think it should probably be scratched. Um, I think uh, to make an excellent decision on this, it would take a little bit more research, but off the top of my head, I would definitely have to agree about the condom service, but also I think looking into um, the student handbooks um, and the Allisonian, and I think um, there could be some re budget reductions uh, there. Making some of the pages in the Allisonian black and white, I think, would save a lot of money, and maybe the, uh, if the student handbook were optional to purchase, because I think a lot of students don't use it. 
As an assistant on, I think that the condom service is really important for residences, so I wouldn't want to touch that. But I'm with Pat, definitely the uh, test bank is on its last legs because of intellectual property concerns. And be that as it may, it's the prof's prerogative to assume right and ownership over that material. So I think definitely the notes bank, which is a component of my platform, is a way better, way more collaborative, way more learning conducive tool that we should put together. <coughs> Uh, from what I understand this year, the SAC is running with uh, an operational surplus. Could be wrong about that, I think I'm right. So I don't really see any need to cut anything. I did, uh, there is one thing the SAC puts on their services that I really, really dislike. It is all that dancing. You guys, I'm sorry, it's pretty good, but you can, there's too many dances. Too much dancing. Too much dancing. Never done it. Too much dancing. Do you want to no, dancing, like they put on, they dance a lot. Thank they you, use like common, they dance, they, they have to sit through like four dances. Thank you, son. Hand that down. We're gonna have Sean McGilly start this next lightning round. Are we doing nine questions? Um, we'll see how far we get. Okay. Preferably nine questions. The next lightning round question. Do you believe that Mount Allison has facilities and services that are second to none? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> hmm. well, the new Fine and Performing Arts Center is supposed to be one. It should be second to none, but that's a very controversial topic. Um, I think we have access to uh, professors that are second to none. Are our facilities second to none? Uh, I would have to refute that. Um, absolutely, I have to agree. In terms of facilities, I don't think we're, we're lacking in um, you know, great facilities for our departments. Um, that being said, I think that in terms of being a science student, I think we're severely lacking in terms of technology and being cutting edge um, in the lab and uh, in technical aspects of our science degrees. Uh, in the 30 seconds, I guess I'll just touch on the two different areas of deliberate action science education. Um, on the science front, I, I do agree that uh, some of the labs are really, really, really outdated. Um, a lot of professors are not happy about that. And on the arts front, uh, we do have a few buildings that could really uh, use some new flooring, uh, so to speak, um, and just uh, nicer classrooms in, in some of the older, older, older buildings. Uh, I noticed this question is actually pulled word for word from a quote that uh, that I am quoted on uh, on the university webpage. Uh, I do very much believe that Mount Allison has facilities and services that are second to none, uh, given the context in which it exists. Uh, Mount A is a very small school that has chosen strategically to remain small, uh, and, and given uh, given the political climate in the province and the underfunding of universities, which is a chronic problem, uh, I think that Mount Allison actually does very well with what's available, and I would say that it, that it does have facilities and services that are second to none. Uh, I think it's I think it's uh, the responsibility of us as students uh, to make sure that we express uh, what the priorities are for students for how to improve them. Uh, but actually, I, I think that Mount A uh, does do its facilities and services very well given the context in which it's placed. I think Pat said it really well. I think uh, Mount A is a world-renowned university, and people understand that it is you know um, it really targets uh, a liberal arts education for its students. However, I do see lacking of service in the career counseling uh, front. Um, there has, you know, there has been advancements. Last year, we saw the implementation of Scott York. However, based on other small liberal art, or small universities uh, in the country, I think there's a lot, a lot of potential, and uh, I think we really need to capitalize on that right now because we have amazing students, and we need to ensure that they are getting the support and the help that they need in order to succeed. Um, I think it depends how you define facilities. If you're talking about the actual buildings and um, the different resources they have, you know, I think we're doing okay for considering we're a small school. Um, but I think where we really thrive is in our community outreach and uh, things like Shinerama. I don't know if that really falls into this category, but I mean, for sure, like, I mean, it just shows the national award that uh, the Shinerama just got, just kind of shows that. 
I think for a mame size, we do pretty well. Uh, you have to have certain expectations that come with carrying the costs of operating a university with a smaller population, for sure. Are there rooms for, is there room for improvement? Absolutely, of course, there always is. I know I've definitely taken classes in rooms that have been uncomfortable and kind of dizzying, like in Flemington, which is not so awesome. But you get through it and it's okay, and the learning environment here is fantastic. So I think that's definitely worth it. There are some really great things about the school. If I had any guesses, you guys will hear on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, this place pretty much saved my life. Unfortunately, uh, as much as we like to see the great image for, for as it is, uh, fortunately, the, the, as the truth uh, prevails, um, Michael Watkins, the, 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 the current VP Campus Life, informed me that facilities were uh, one of his top complaints. Fix it and uh, other services that respond to facilities aren't there, the dining services, I mean, there's no choice. We have to pay $4,000 a year away. That's not good. That's not second to none. That's not choice. That's not getting what we need done for facilities and our services. I'm sorry, it's just, they're not second to none. As someone that is looking forward, I have to say that they are not second to none. Um, I believe that we are a great school, our buildings are great, our labs are amazing, but I have to say that we can improve. So on the academic side of things, uh, the labs could take some improving, some of the classrooms, the seats are falling apart, so that could take some uh, improvement. But the on athletic side of things, I think there's some major, drastic changes that can happen, such as the turf field investment and other things such as locker rooms and just simply athletic facilities need to be improved. Thank you. So the question is, should the staff executive speak with one voice at all times in public? Um, yes, I think that the staff executive should speak with one voice at all times in public. Um, I think if you're speaking, if you're talking towards people, then then definitely you, you know you should have a unified vision and get the information out there efficiently. Um, and let students know, you know, you know what's happening. Um, if they're going to be asking, you know, students things, and I don't think one voice is, is necessary in that in that role. But if you're going to be informing people, speaking to people, then one voice is definitely always a, a more efficient way of, of uh, getting your information out there. Uh, yeah, I think that one voice is good. Uh, is it all realistic? Uh, not always. Uh, we are all human beings, we're just students, we're you know, 20 years old, uh, we we're going to have our differences. But I think that the place where those differences should really be taken care of is in the executive meetings and at council meetings. Um, but having said that, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, but do I think that we should be speakers as well? That, yes, I do. And that's why it's, it's important to, to kind of elect an exec executive that's willing to work with each other um, so that you don't kind of run into that problem. Uh, I mean, the, the value of the executive committee is that where you're in that, in that small group environment, that environment of six, uh, you have six uh, generally very opinionated, very intelligent people uh, who often do bring different perspectives. And that's, that's where you hammer out your differences, and that's where you come up with a solution that you think is best for students. Um, at the same time, the executive also relies on council to hold it accountable uh, and to make sure that all students from different constituencies, so you're off campus, you're on campus, your different faculties uh, have their opportunity to express their views as well. So I would say yes, I think the executive should take the opportunity to hammer out their differences uh, in, in those executive committee meetings. Uh, and then I think that they should rely on council to hold them to account and rely on students to hold council to account. Um, so I think the government structure uh, affords the executive the opportunity uh, to, to do that. I think it's important to understand that the SAC executive obviously is representing a myriad of different opinions and values. Um, and at the end of the day, when the SAC executive is going to public, I think it is necessary for students to know that this, this voice in public is a collaboration of all of the opinions um, of the executives of the SAC. However, I think it's absolutely necessary that the SAC executive does remain a united front because it, it essentially legitimizes the, the union. If you're gonna have a SAC that's constantly, you know, saying all different opinions, people aren't gonna aren't gonna trust the SAC. So I think it's it's imperative that uh, there is one voice spoken at all times. Um, I would say yes, definitely, especially 
I'm coming from experience working um, in a small organization and with uh, different teams. Um, you have to present a unified front. You have to believe in each other and you have to have each other's backs and back each other up even if maybe you don't 100% agree with what you know the the message you're trying to put out there. I mean, that's exactly like how Pat said, you hash those things out in meetings um, as a group, but when you're presenting yourselves to the public, you need to, you need everyone to believe in you. You have to believe in the team. Yeah, I think you don't out your team members in public. If you know that what you say in a private context remains there and stays there, then that process and that analysis can be far more critical and far more open than it would be if you feel like you're gonna have to stick to exactly what you said in a meeting later on. You don't out people, you need to be able to pick a message, stick to it, and know that you can trust everybody to stay on track. Yeah, I totally agree with this idea of teamwork. Um, should the exact SAC executives speak with one voice at all times in public? No, but on SAC issues, they should. They should, need, they should definitely come to an understanding about what their stance is on things that are being released to the public and have the same idea of what that is. If this, the executive doesn't understand what the president said or somebody else in the executive said, they need to make that clear, make sure they're a unified team on SAC issues. Of course, having your own individual personality is important to so support that as well. So, one voice. The SAC Executive group, uh, Committee is, it should be composed of many different opinions. It should uh, house and be open to a bunch of different opinions of all the exec. But it's very important that when you're going to CAS or NBSA, let's just say, um, it's very important that the uh, VP external and the president have a general idea of the same, uh, have a general, uh, the same general opinion. Uh, but I'm not saying that the whole exec cannot have multiple opinions. If two ideas are brought forward that are, uh, that are good and, and feasible, then why not present two ideas? Thank you. One more. The um, SAC executive should speak with one voice. I think it's fundamentally important. Uh, I think the executive committee is the, uh, is the I, in my opinion, that's what it's designed for, to hash it out. Um, in my opinion, I, I have a hard time with being muzzled, so I will be heard in SAC executive meetings. But um, no, I will I will speak with one voice in public with my executive. Starting in Paris, how much can the SAC realistically achieve in one year? Uh, that's a bit of a broad question, but uh, realistically, uh, you can't. Uh, I don't think you can, uh, you know, say you. Uh, we came and wanted to do these five things. We did these five things. We wanted to come in and do these ten things. We did these ten things. I think realistic what the SAC uh, can do is, 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 as cliche as it sounds, endless in some terms, as long as everybody's willing to work together. Um, as long as you have everybody on the executive committee uh, coming in with good ideas and, and the council understanding what the work the executive committee is doing, I think the SAC can achieve uh, what, whatever goals it comes in with for that year. Uh, I think this act can achieve a great deal in one year. I think it can achieve even more in a larger number of years, um, which is why I think continuity is very important. I mean, one of the one of the big successes that we've had recently is the implementation of a new health and dental plan, and that's something that has been years and years of work, um, and, and it did get lost in the cracks and in places in between. But it was that consistency that uh, that allowed that to get done. At the same time, there are a lot of things that can get done within the within the uh, the, the limitations of one year. For example, um, I did not come into this year expecting that I would be opposing uh, term limits on dog contracts, but that was an issue that came up this year. That was an issue that the SAC uh, dealt with and something that we pushed back on and, and something ultimately that was changed. So I think absolutely you can accomplish a lot in a year and I also think that continuity is important uh, because you're not operating uh, in isolation in that one year. I think it's uh, difficult to give a quantitative value you know, as to how much can be achieved in one year. However, I do think a great deal can be achieved based on the SAC executive and what their mandates are and the time that they're willing to put into the various um, initiatives. And um, I, think, I think it also is something to be said based on the complexity of the initiatives that are being put forth. You, know? you could have three large initiatives that are you know, established and put into place in one year. 
However, you could have 10 small initiatives that are put in and last for the next you know, 10 years in the future. So I think you really have to look at the executive team and what they're willing to put into their put into their jobs and put into their mandates. And I think it's also, um, you know, you have to be realistic to see how much can actually be achieved based on uh, the complexity of the initiatives. Um, I guess a lot. I think a lot can be achieved. Um, you know, the SAC is sort of a, a bottom-up organization. If you use your resources, you use the students, a lot of, you know, little projects that, you know, various students are really passionate towards can, um, you know, happen and can be improved. But I think overall, um, you know, you can only have so many huge goals. And I think like it's important to present a lot of ideas to the table and then see which ones are feasible. And I think, you know, one or two like really big goals, um, you know, to achieve over the course of the whole year would be a realistic achievement. Provided that the SAC executive walks in with the desire to cooperate and to really collaborate and walk in with realistic and achievable goals that they've really thought about. I think that the SAC can achieve a tremendous amount in setting a tone in council, reaching out to students, weathering storms or issues that come up unexpectedly. I think that when you put a committed body of students together who are engaged and actively interested and care about the student population at large, that you can see great things even in what is relatively a short year. Um, I think this question can be directly answered um, based on the decisions you voters make during this election. Will you vote for somebody who's realistic but also has the confidence and potential and the good ideas to get things done? Or you can vote for somebody who, you know, would just be good uh, at you know, filling time. Either way, you're, the SAC is directly responsible to the members of the Mount Allison community for getting things done. I think realistically, that's that's directly reflective of the people that you guys vote in to get these things done. So, realistically, in one year, obviously, it depends on the year. Um, what the SAC can achieve can personally be separated into two. Uh, so, initiatives, projects that someone wants to start, as well as representing students. So, there's not just starting projects, there's also the main thing of representing students. So, depending on how many issues happen in a year, how many conflicts happen in a year, so basically the Dawn contract and the Memorial Library. It's been quite an intense first semester and really depends on the year and it's not just your exec but the determination and that thing exactly. Seems to be kind of a philosophical question on your outlook on life. So um, <laughs> let me answer carefully. Um, I think I don't think you can put a limit on what the SAC can achieve in a year. I mean, as Pat noted, a momental achievement with a student health and dental plan, uh, it's momentous. Um, whether it be one thing or three or ten, I mean, as long as they benefit students at the end of the day, does it really matter how much? Um, that's kind of my philosophy to counter that. Um, absolutely is a philosophical question. Um, how much can the SAC realistically achieve? Uh, again, there's no, there's no limit. There, there's definitely no upper bound on, on that uh, on that achievement goal. Um, I think that you know going back to what Pat said earlier about you know policy and and branding. I think that if you know when you write an essay, you have to have the intro, the your three arguments, and your conclusion. If you have a framework, then that makes it more sustainable for years to come, and uh, you know the the sky's the limit as to how more efficient we can become year to year to year. Thank you. Um, our next question is: What is an appropriate level for SAC fees? Well, I mean, the fees that the fee level that we operate on now is, is there for a reason. I mean, uh, yeah, our, our fees are quite high. Mount A tends to have high fees. We have uh, high student union fees. We have high tuition. Uh, the Argosy has one of the highest paper fees in the country. Uh, it, it's the nature of the beast when you're at a small institution and when there's a small number of people funding your organization. Um, 
The, the challenge that the SAC faces in controlling its fees is in order to keep those fees low sustainably and not lower them only to have to jack them up again in a few years, you do need a sustainable uh, extra source of revenue. Uh, the challenge with that is often if you want to start a business or something like that, you need space. Uh, and then to buy the space, you need that extra revenue. Um, that's something that I've tried to tackle this year uh, by coming up with an investment strategy. So that's something that's been ongoing this year and, and that we'll have in place by, by the end of the year. Uh, and I think that will, will put us into a mindset where we can talk about sustainable fee lowering uh, or, or whether we want to increase fees or maintain them and, and increase our services. I think all students want to know where their $201 are going when they pay their Student Administrative Council fee. And so Pat says it well by saying that fees absolutely need to be sustainable. So if we do, if we do ever lower them, they have to, you know, they have to remain the same um, for, for practical reasons. However, I think that students need to be able to see tangible outputs of what the SAC is actually providing for them. And I think, um, I think right now students, students, have, students have voice concern. They are confused as to where, where their fees are going. And I think once they're, once they're seen, I think, uh, I think the $201 is, is, is fine. Um, you can't exactly put an exact um, number on it, but I think as long as the students think that they're getting value out of that money, and if they think that value is equal to or greater than the amount they're paying, then I think that's an appropriate level um, for SAC fees. Um, one thing that I would hope to do is look at other universities and what are they paying, what services does their student union provide, and then see how money compares to that. I think at their current level, SAC fees are perfectly acceptable. The student body has the opportunity to overwhelmingly, in many cases, elect this council and this executive. So you want to provide them with enough financial resources to actually do something tangible and so that the students see reasonable benefit. I've never heard directly any complaining about the SAC fees, so I would say from that experience that people are okay with paying it. I think Pat's absolutely right. In a small institution, sometimes you look at fees that might be higher um, when compared to other institutions, but I think we can all agree that it's worth it and the quality we see is, is definitely worth the money. Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, the SAC currently is running on surplus. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means, I mean, maybe fees are too high. Um, there's something called the Teach Toronto just School or Teachers Pension Fund in Toronto. And they just bought the uh, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. Now, Pat ran last year, Pat Joyce ran last year on a series of investments that would keep the SAC sustainable beyond simply charging fees. If those work out, I mean, just like the teacher student union, uh, certain teachers union, there's no telling where we can go. Fees could be lowered potentially if uh, Pat's uh, investments work out. And, uh, I'd like to see that happen. So, the appropriate level for SAC fees. Um, I think it's quite representative of the benefits that they are experiencing. Appropriate level, it's purely reflective of what they're experiencing. Now, at $201, and with the number of students that we project for each budget, in the past few years we've actually been over budgeting, so we've actually been having surplus. Now what I think that what we should do with this surplus is giving it right back to the students within those four years. So that's it. It's the appropriate level will be represented by how many services we uh, ben will benefit them. Thank you. Should there be an operational surplus? No. Is there? Yes. So, uh, although I agree with the point that um, <clears throat> we should have a surplus and it was by no malfeasance that we have a surplus, I don't think, I think we need to look for other sources of income and I know the executive this year has tried to do that and I'm confident they will. Uh, so once we're able to um, develop another source of income, I think it would be appropriate that we begin to see a reduction in SAC fees. Because $201 is a lot of money on top of on tuition and all the other expenses that come with post-secondary education. Um, I think that the appropriate level for SAC fees is, is the level that, that lets us function well. Um, we are a separate uh, you know, entity from the university, so you can think of us as a corporation, a corporation needs to run. That being said, we should not be running with a profit, which we don't. We certainly 
we aim to break even every school year, and uh, we do have a surplus. Um, that being said, looking into ways to reduce SAC fees, um, but I haven't heard any complaints as to the, as to the current level of, of SAC fees. Um, I think uh, SAC fees could be lowered a little bit, um, especially because a lot of students complain about tuition freeze, uh, uh, sorry, not tuition freeze, uh, tuition uh, going up. Um, and that's a valid concern, you know, it's money in your pocket, especially if you're coming to school where everything's very expensive. Having said that, um, is it going to just happen? Uh, no. Uh, I think because right now the way the SAC runs, we're aiming to break even. Uh, in order for that to happen, we would have to see some sort of a renewable income coming from the SAC. And we're in kind of a good position right now where we have the uh, uh, operation surplus. Uh, we have surplus that we can work with to make some sort of a uh, plan, which is happening. So the next question, under what circumstances would you publicly criticize university administrators? That's a tough one. Um, I would say when students have the opportunity to stand in front of the administration and you know vocally criticize them, these are usually people that have been elected in. But I would say when students feel that their their rights, their voices are not being heard by the administration, and the administration is essentially impeding on those voices, um, I would say is an appropriate time to voice concern um, and essentially criticize them. However, um, th this is a very difficult question and it's circumstantial completely, but I think when students' voices are not heard um, is, is the correct time. Um, I guess I'm a strong believer in not ever personally attacking anyone, but if you can provide a specific example and be like, I disagree with this decision that this person made, I think that is perfectly fine. And um, I guess like it comes down to the circumstance, but I mean, it's perfectly within your right, I think, to criticize a decision someone has made. I'm with Brent. I think uh, this is entirely circumstantial, and I can tell you that it would have to be something overwhelmingly substantial to push me to the point of publicly criticizing anybody. We talked about earlier not outing your team members. The administration is, in a greater sense, a member of your team. You will get farther with them if they know that they will be respected by you in public, and if they know that if you have an issue, you'll bring it up in private and give them the opportunity to make the necessary changes. So, absent some profoundly concerning circumstance, I would be very reluctant um, to criticize university administrators publicly. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, well, I've, from working on a residence exec, I noticed there's a way the uh, school administration can kind of hear you but not actually listen, or listen but not, but not actually hear you, that is they have a way of deaf ears and kind of fall on specific issues. If there's a situation in which all the students are saying, we need this, like this is huge, like, you know, Jennings is on fire, nobody's called the fire department, the administration's like, oh, we can't have no. I mean, obviously, if there's a pressing concern that students are concerned about, then I would criticize the inverse administrators in order to use outside power, in order to leverage them into back in the negotiations. Kind of scary. Um, you better be quite sure about yourself if you're going to criti openly criticize the university admin administrators. Um, so, for example, the uh, Memorial Library, if for some reason some alumni are going to argue that they should demolish the Memorial Library, administration says, well, it has to be. If the, if the alumni were to present some engineer or architectural documents to say that it's okay, we can save the building without demolishing completely, then it, ha it should be brought forward. But if the evidence is not substantial, if it's not, if it's not going to get you anywhere, then you don't make a fool out of yourself. I believe in diplomacy, but at the end of the day, you elect me. I have no allegiance to university administrators. I do not work for them. I work for you. Um, it's your union. It's the students' union. It's not the PEGS' union. Uh, to be quite honest, I believe, of course, to enter in dialogue peacefully, but if they're not going to budge, 
what, do I, what political capital do I have as a student but to publicly criticize you and try to get more students on my side? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think that you know not all criticism is bad criticism. Uh, I think it, it can be an effective tool considering that you know we pay the university to offer us a service in terms of education. And uh, I think you know definitely do your homework, do your research. You know have the dialogue with the university. At the end of the day, criticism is, is not a negative thing when when someone is offering you a service and they're not providing that service. It's time for you to, to use other items in your toolbox. Um, for me, it would be very circumstantial, but I've had, at the end of the day, um, if students have brought forward a concern and that concern is not being met with, I have no problem public interest as the university administration. Um, having said that, there's always a nice way of doing some specific things. Um, and uh, the way I would go about it is um, before the meeting uh, or before whatever public uh, event is happening, I would kind of just give them a heads up that, listen, I'm going to bring this up. And um, you can either tell me right now why I shouldn't, or you'll have to deal with it at that point. Uh, what it comes down to, I think, is when people are not included substantively in decision-making processes, then they get frustrated. Um, and if the approach is not collaborative, then it becomes confrontational. Uh, so, so I think that's kind of the principle under which I make my decisions when it comes to, to criticizing people publicly. Um, if you've given me an opportunity uh, to have my input substantively considered, and if we've actually had a meaningful discussion uh, where I've really had the opportunity to, to share my opinions and have my voice really heard, um, th then I'm not going to yell at you all of a sudden if I disagree with an outcome. But if there's been no opportunity for me uh, to actually be included or to help out with the decision-making process, then of course I'm going to be frustrated and of course I'm going to criticize you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll try and get one or two more of uh, these lightning round questions. Um, so next up, we have a question. What is the appropriate level for tuition and ancillary fees at Renegade? Question. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I think it comes down to, um, you know, what is the standard across the country, um, you know, comparing our school to other schools and seeing, you know, what kind of value do we get out of that education and whether or not, you know, if we pay higher fees, well, is it because we're getting a better education than at other institutions? Um, in general, um, I mean, I don't think that tuition should be going up at all. You know, schools, post-secondary education should be, like my personal opinion is that the government needs to, you know, be more supportive in that and reducing tuition fees. I think at the current level, tuition fees are relatively high if you look across the board in Canada at what most students pay. But we are also here in a smaller institution. We expect a very high level of quality that I think is reflected by things like the number of both scholars that we've sent abroad, like the number of students who are very successful uh, in master's applications and programs, and so on. So I think that at their current level, tuition is high, but that's what we should expect if we're looking to get huge rewards out of our education. I mean, Mount Allison's a great school. Peter Mansbridge. It's not for me now. And if we want a great education and a great environment, we're going to have to charge the money for it. Another important thing is also why we're all here, getting the right people who uh, you know, have the power to spend your money and so many fees in the right positions. Are these people serious? Are they, are they going to be responsible with your money, uh, with your resources? And I think I, I encourage everybody to get their money's worth out of these people who are in services that you see as not doing number one because that's what we are. Um, I really don't like the word appropriate for this question or the other one earlier. Um, we are paying the appropriate level of tuition fees and the tuition and ancillary fees. fees. Um, it's the cost it is because it costs that much to run the institution. If it was lower, then we would get less resources. If it was higher, then we would get more. It's, it's an awkward question, but it's, I, I have to agree that we have we should demand for a lower tuition, but they are appropriate for the present situation. Um, this is more of a question for you to tell me what is appropriate for you. Uh, tuition level could be fine for me, 
but it's not all about me. You should tell me what, what are you willing to pay. I mean, I fundamentally believe that post-secondary education is a right, but we also at the end of the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the day have to realize that, I mean, the university has significant infrastructure costs, I mean, fees have to be paid, but on the other extreme, this shouldn't be a corporation that's making money off of us. I, I mean, in all honesty, it should be similar to the union and that it breaks even uh, and it doesn't sit on a pool of money, which the current is possible. We can talk more about that later. <laughs> um, exactly, exactly right. Uh, I think the appropriate level is the one determined by you know, what can students afford. Um, I, I definitely think that the appropriate level, me personally being a scientist and liking to see the numbers, liking to see the see proof, um, the appropriate level is one in which I have a say in how how the university is spending and therefore how much tuition they need to bring in. Because the tuition could they could be breaking even, but if their spending is out of control, well then that's that's not equivalent. You know, that so if I can have a say in how the spending is going, then I would say that you know this is the appropriate level based on the efficiency of your spending. Yeah, I think it's all about being informed. I mean, if you know uh, a tuition necessary, necessary budget, is, it does exactly that. It's supposed to break even. And um, right now, what the university's budget for the next three years is deficit. Um, and so it's, it's you just you have to be aware of that and just have to say to yourself, where is all this money going? And then based on that, make that appropriate uh, judgment. Right now, am I willing to make that judgment? No, because I, 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 for me, it is appropriate, but again, it depends on what the most of the students say, what people are thinking um, in terms of that. Well, hell, let's be honest, in a perfect world, zero is the most appropriate number. I mean, a, a fully publicly funded post-secondary education system would be great. Um, it, it's the province that controls tuition fees. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think it would be great for the province to make an investment in post-secondary and make it free and accessible to anybody that wants to, just like they do with elementary and secondary education. Uh, at the same time, there's a valuable discussion to be had about uh, whether whether the province should be funding operating costs of the university to keep tuition low, or whether they should be funding direct student financial aid programs to put tuition directly in the pockets of those students who need it most. That's a really valuable discussion to have, um, and that's something that I think uh, a very uh, rebuffed NBSA should be having. It's something that our colleagues in Nova Scotia have been doing. Um, in an ideal world, zero. Uh, and otherwise, I think I think you need to focus on putting money in the in the pockets of students who need it to be able to afford tuition. I think the appropriate level of tuition is really all relative. Um, yes, we have one of the highest tuitions in the country. However, we have some of the best teacher-student ratios in the country. So really, if you're looking at the value you, that you're getting, um, I think currently, based on the rewards that students are getting after they complete their four or five years at Mount A, um, you know, ju justify the current tuition that, uh, that Mount A has. Do you have a question? So the next question, what is the optimal balance for the SAC in in advocacy and providing services? Well, I think both elements are obviously important. I mean, the SAC operates here to make sure that your needs are met, um, but they're also here to provide you with you know, a variety of different things like the condom service or the test bank. Um, so I, you know, I think the SAC really needs to hit the middle of the road on this one and make sure that they're advocating where you see fit to advocate, um, but also providing you with things that maybe benefit you, but that you haven't asked for directly. I think uh, from my position to the VP Campus Life, I mean, you want a perfect balance here. You want to know what's going on in campus life, what's, what do students want, what do your constituents want, and give it to them and provide that back in spades. Um, Obviously, you can't go, you know, kick in somebody's door and say like, "Hey, like, what do you need?" Like, oh, there's people who don't want to be involved, and there's people that do. And I think engaging those people who are keen, such as clubs and societies and other people uh, on campus, students who want to advocate, listen to them and give them what they want. So I'd say about a probably a 50 50 balance are both equally important. In my mind. <clears throat> so for the optimal balance. Um, I think it's relative to the situation of the school, so 
presently for the past year, we've been quite opinionated and we've really wanted our opinion to get to people higher up. So for the past semester, I would say that we've been really engaging in a lot of advocacy, but working a lot less on the services. And I believe that it should maintain at a 50-50, but when there's a need for advocacy, it's obviously going to overpower the services because we want to be heard over getting the comments. Um, it's difficult for me to expand on this question because I can answer it easily. It should be the same. Uh, the terms are synonymous to me and what, how your union should represent you. It should give you 50% advocacy and 50% providing services. And, I mean, each VP should balance that within their portfolio. It's, I don't know, it's a no-brainer. Uh, yeah, um, I would even turn this on an even more philosophical head and say that engaging in advocacy is a service that the SAC provides uh, to students and that let's put 100% into that because the portfolio includes both, I, I would say. Um, okay. Uh, I'd have to go with uh, just answering the question straightforward. Uh, optimal balance is 50-50. Um, it always depends on what the students want. So if you want more advocacy, then that's what the SAC executive and the SAC council should be doing. If you want more services, then that's what they should be doing. It all just comes down to what the students want from your executive. You are electing them for a specific reason. I don't think that this conflict needs to exist. Um, I think that I think that services um, services are, are what are what inform your advocacy efforts uh, and and in, in some instances can fund them uh, if you have for profit services which would be great for it um, and again uh, as as Nikki said advocacy absolutely is a service people pay thousands of dollars for lobbyists to go and lobby on their behalf um, I I don't really uh, I don't really agree that there's a conflict between the two of them and I think that it's a matter of focusing your services so that you get people engaged with your advocacy, uh, and I think it's a matter of keep, keeping people informed about your advocacy so that they're aware of the service that it is. Yeah, the role of the SAC is really to represent students and provide them with the needs and wants that, they, that they're asking you for. Um, and so essentially, I think um, as long as the SAC is able to provide the services flawlessly, um, as well as advocating, is is completely fine. So I would say I would say absolutely 50-50, but um, as Pat and Nikki said, I, I do think advocacy is a service. So as long as the SAC is just providing the services, regardless of what they are, is is acceptable and is what the SAC should be doing uh, with its mandate. Yeah, I mean, one isn't more important than the other. It really just depends on the year, um, you know, what's going on, what are the needs for that specific time. So like, you know, it's 50-50, but then it depends on, you know, what is lacking. What, like, if the services start, um, you know, suffering, then, you know, focus on services. But overall, you know, they're equally important. Thank you. Thank you. One final question, and then we can all go home. We're going to have some delicious Scott Spring and Caramel ice cream. <laughs> what do you feel are, this is poorly worded grammar last month, what do you feel are the state of Argosy CHMA relations with the SAC? And maybe if you want to mention where they should be. Um, okay, well, I think for the Argosy, uh, the op-ed editor has been really critical. But we know those who can't do, but um, op-ed editors. Um, I feel like the state is pretty fine. The Argosy needs to keep in check uh, what's going on. They're the only source of, well, one of the very few sources of media on campus, CHMA is the other one. and. They need to make sure that the, the SAC is doing its job, and if there's a conspiracy or there's something going on very insidious, the RGC needs to uncover that. CHMA, uh, I know there's a show about uh, the SAC has their own show, but um, I, I, think, I think more, definitely more participation should be there, more uh, with the SAC on the radio, and we should, I think we should hear more about them from day to week to week what's going on. So the relationship that exists. 
natural as in any media and politics that we've all heard from throughout the world. Um, the media wants to put the sack on the pedestal. It's you, it's normal. The, the media wants to make information public. So if the sack screws up or whatever, I don't know what happens. But the RBC is obviously going to want to make that public. So I personally think that there should be better communication between the SAC and the RBC, well, the forms of media and the SAC, so that there is a decrease in conflict of something that was just simply misunderstood. But I think it's normal for the RBC, well, for media, uh, forms of media to be conflictual with uh, forms of rep representation. I rather enjoy it currently, the two animo the animosity in the room is kind of fun. Um, you, know, it, 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 you know, we could always be on better terms, but you know, to reiterate what these gentlemen said, I mean, who's going to check the union? Uh, it has to be the Argosy, it has to be CHMA, it, you know, it, it's, it's natural. So, although, you know, it could be better, it, it won't, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's funny when you when you read this question on this board. It looks like they're two mutually exclusive groups, but when you when you look at the heart of it, they're they're just students, students like Julie who have been on the SAC and have been in the Argosy. So she carries that knowledge, you know, from both platforms back and forth. And you know, I'm I'm happy with the state of, of the relationship that that's going on right now. I don't think they're. I don't think there's you know deep seated hate. I think people are doing their jobs, are doing it well, and uh, you know it's exciting when someone checks you and you know are you informed. It allows you to grow as an executive, as a person, and it pushes you to that next level to excel and to exceed. So uh, it's great. Um, I personally think that the, the the relations between the two should be a positive one. Um, I, I I understand that it's not always the case, but um, like John said to me earlier in the year, he said all. The RBC does, it just wants to get students thinking. Um, and, and that's fine. But I think we should always keep in mind that we're all here for students, uh, for ourselves. And so uh, if there's something incredibly negative about, about the SAC uh, in, in the media, it, it might make students you know, more negative about the SAC. And, and that's not always a good thing because then they look, oh, it's just the SAC. Right? So I think, I think it should, there's, there's a certain level of balance that we need to strike, and I think we're doing that currently. Uh, I think the Argosy this year has done a great job of holding us to account. Um, I think that there's always going to be challenges when you have people with different personal philosophies uh, about what uh, you know what what the other should be doing or whatever. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, that that they're resources for for, for each other. Uh, I think that the RGC is a resource for the SAC to communicate with students about what it's doing, uh, and I think that the SAC is a resource for the RGC, um in, in getting that feedback from people who who work on issues like tuition and financial aid. Um, I think the one thing that hasn't really been mentioned is with regard to CHMA, the main uh, conflict, if there, if there is any, or competition comes from our entertainment. Um, and I would very much, uh, I'd very much like to see a, a bit more collaboration there. Certainly they do, uh, we do bring in different crowds at certain times, but uh, I think it would be possible to bring in a lot better acts of entertainment if we were more collaborative with CHMA. Um, and and I, th I think it's a reciprocal relationship to, uh, to answer in short. I think uh, the RGC, CHMA, and the SAC are all legitimate forums for debate, and everyone is obviously, uh, you know, allowed to have their own opinion. And I think these opinions should be represented on all three of these, um, you know, forums for debate. I, you have to keep in mind that a lot of topics on campus right now are quite controversial. So with that, in turn, you're obviously going to have uh, debate and conflicts. So I think currently uh, the state of uh, the relationship between the three entities are, are legitimate and fine. Um, I would have to say that I think their relationship is as it should be. Um, I mean, the RGC promotes SAC events as you know, a form of advertising and also criticizes the SAC. And that's just the way you know, media works. And you know, I don't think that their you know, the relationship is negative and I don't think I would hope that there's some measure of mutual respect between all of those entities. I think it's important to um, you know, take into account that everyone's going to come to the table with a different angle on something. There are existing tensions. I'd say that that's positive. That's indicative of objective evaluation and holding different people to account, making sure that someone like me continues to do their job on the terms I said I would do it. 
And I, so I think that any existing tension is really perhaps a very positive thing. All right. Thank you to our nine candidates. And thank you to everybody who came out. Um, it's great to have you. Maybe we'll do this again in the future. And voting is, of course, January 31st and February 1st. And you will do that 